And welcome to the Spring Championship of Online Poker 2021. I'm Maria Ho with Calvin Anderson. Happy Friday, guys, which means it's a rest day for the Scoop Grinders, but no rest for us and for all you guys tuning in because there's no new event starting and there's nothing concluding. We are going to go over a couple of final tables from the last few days of Scoop. So we are going to focus on the non holdem tournaments which is why we bring in some experts like calvin who is very familiar with the mixed games and we're going to kick things off with event number 27 high the 1k8 game what's up calvin what's going on how's it going I mean, are you a little bit excited? Is this the next best thing to playing Scoop is maybe commentating over a eight game, which is probably one of your favorite mixed game formats, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, it's a little bit of everything. I actually enjoy commentating more. <laughs> wow, I'm surprised to hear that. Well, let's take a look at these seven players that have made this final table. Are there any names that you recognize, Calvin? Any nemesis of yours from pre previous scoops that you've played against? Yeah, I battled a little bit with these guys. A uh, couple, couple new faces, but uh, yeah. Well, last week when I did the scoop replays with Benny, we actually saw pre-move on one of the final tables. I believe it was the five-card draw. So 
not surprised, you know, to see some of these players show up again at these final tables. Obviously, the mixed games have probably a smaller field and smaller regs, you know, number of regs that, you know, end up in these tournaments, especially in the high buy-ins, so. Yeah, I think Troll Ringin is the only guy I don't recognize. Um, yeah. All right, well, first game up right now is Limit, Triple Draw, Deuce to Seven. I think we need to start by telling people what the best hand possible is in Deuce to Seven. That's always a good place to start, is what are the nuts? What's number one, Calvin? Why don't you share that? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I guess they call it a wheel, but it's uh, Deuce, Three, Four, Five, Seven. So, yeah, and then... Yeah, so ace is considered high in this game, and deuce is the lowest card, and you can't make a straight or a flush. So those are the big, uh, the big key points, and you want to get the lowest hand as possible. Yeah, so usually I would say that you'll see some of these players, if they start opening the action, they probably have a type of hand where they're going to be discarding two cards. Because usually if you open the action from early position and you're drawing three... Usually it's not that good of a hand. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen, but I'm just saying that from early position, you're not really going to see. Well, I don't know. Maybe you, Calvin. You you, you sometimes get in there with. <laughs> you, you know, it depends on the, it depends on a few things and the, the chips. And there's, there's always like exceptions when you're playing tournaments because, for sure. you know, like for example, a bit too easy here is really short. So, um, you know, you can be more, a bit more cautious. With, with a short and start. I think, yeah, a bit too easy was so short to start, but actually just ended up busting in seventh place. So quick final table for a bit too easy. Yeah, the the game's going really quick right now. It's like people aren't stalling. They're not. They're just going for it, you know. And this is this is a big game, you know. Whenever you look at, whenever you're thinking about the different games, this is a one winner game that plays like pretty massive. You know, it has. What like four streets of betting with a lot of re-raises. So I, I would say that this game is and maybe stud or the they play pretty much the biggest. So you'll see a lot of knockouts in like this specific game, and then um, yeah, maybe stud because there's one winner. Yeah, so, so yeah, here as it looks we saw like... one. Yeah, and Rubinho paired the fours on the end with no draws left. Pretty kind of thin value, but I, I like the bet. Yeah, definitely. You will see a lot of people usually just, you know, check back a 10 low. Both players discarding one. Big hit. Mm-hmm. Huge hand Ooh, there for Troll. Yeah. <laughs> Quick call as well. And, and, and that's what you're kind of saying is I, I noticed that in limit action and the play moves a bit faster than in no limit with people's timing. But certainly they, they do seem to be playing even more quickly than I would have thought. Yeah, they're playing really fast for sure. This is a really interesting spot for uh, LOL here. Wow. I, don't, I can't even commentate on that. That was an interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously, Deuce to Seven is one of those games where I think if you're starting to dabble and learn mixed games, you probably want to pick up Deuce to Seven maybe a little bit later on. Usually, I feel like Omaha is one of the easier games to transition to from Hold'em. And then the stud games, you know, it takes a, a bit of time to finesse those, but at least stud, stud high-low, and Raz all kind of follow the same format, and Deuce is just kind of in and of itself out there. Yeah, whenever you do triple draw, fixed limit, it makes it, it's a pretty tough game to know. A lot of people start out by no limit single draw, and it's way less complex. You know, like you have a seven is like, pretty much the nuts in, 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 in no limit. And then if you have an eight or a nine, it's a really, really good hand. So people can, and it's only like a two, two betting streak game where, so a lot of, um, there's a lot of stories of, you know, 
good holding players going into Deuce Seven No Limit and doing really well because it plays very similar. But this game is this game is very skillful. I would say it's uh, significantly harder than. Yeah, and it's freestanding, you know, so it doesn't necessarily relate to too many other games. So it's, yeah, just like you said, it's it's a little bit tougher. We see a raise here by Woodbine. Is this just someone's address? Like, all we have to do to send something to their house is figure out the first, you know, the house number. But they definitely live on Woodbine Avenue, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good chance of that for sure. <laughs> yeah, okay, but this is so this looks, is a standard open. Yeah. Yeah, and then pretty standard defend here. Uh usually on the first draw you would you would drop the nine and then if you pick it up again, depending upon the situation, you might keep it. So here uh he might keep it, but he, he after he bets he probably is gonna keep it. Just to yeah, you would say that usually on your first draw, if you're drawing really smooth, you know, to a hand that could potentially be one of the nutted hands, you obviously don't need to keep the nine because you have a couple more draws remaining, a couple more chances to make, you know, potentially a seven or an eight. Um, but yes, with maybe one draw remaining, you might see players, you know, hang on to the nine to the 10 because the chances of their opponent making a better hand is a lot slimmer. Definitely. Standard open here, you should probably take it down. You could see a defend by the big blind, maybe. But in a tournament setting, you want to be a little bit more selective, I think, with your defense, just because, you know, it's it's pretty high variance in general. Standard check call. Yeah, so whenever you pick up Another two, you, you kind of have to assume your hand's like a lot stronger than the other guys in general as a draw. Um, so I, he should definitely be calling here, given that he hit a two there to like bluff catch. So yeah, and I think a lot of the yeah, and I think a lot of the viewers who watch No Limit Hold'em primarily can understand this factor of maybe the blockers to the nut hands, right? If somebody gets a lot of sevens, then maybe that's the type of hand that you want to bluff or snow with, but also knowing that your opponent most likely can't make a seven because of that. So true, true. Yeah. A lot of the times the, the lower cards are like a little bit more important, like more twos make it, mm -hmm. make it even better. Um, but yeah, it looks like we had another bust out there. Yeah. Woodbine did play pretty aggressively, was involved in a lot of pots and now has finished in sixth place for Almost $7,500. Again, this is a $1,000 buy-in. This was the high buy-in of this event. Yeah, coming in really hard. Two bust-outs, first game, really quick, you know. Uh, that, that, that game, like I was saying, it plays really, really big. Where, you know, most of the other games are going to play uh, not quite as big. And then when you get to stud, I would say that uh, that's a game that knocks a lot of people out. Um, yeah, and this one, you know, I know I was super excited for us to commentate on Limit Hold'em. Definitely a really <laughs> exciting game. Um, a lot of action, a lot of bluffing, a lot of min bets, guys. Just, you know, do you just wait? <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what's more interesting? I mean, there's, there's just so many, like, chip dynamics that are interesting. Like, you know, when you think about the position that uh, pre-move is in, he can just like take such a wider opening range in so many spots because everyone else is like wanting to get the next jump up in a way. I mean, there's not a lot of ICM pressure because the two, but it's it's just, yeah. I think that's more interesting uh, when it comes to tournaments, even if, it, even if a game is like less popular or whatever, you know, like you can tighten or loosen your range depending upon your uh, your chip stack and the dynamic of that. Yeah, absolutely. Pieface wants to know, Cal, what's your favorite game in the mix, and what do you think you're best at? Um, I think um, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't necessarily have a favorite. I used to. Um, but then it's just like you know, whatever you're doing well at, I you know, I'd recommend playing that you know as a as an outsider, and that's that's kind of what I, whatever. 
I feel like I'm better than people at, at the time or better than the field at. I, I think, you know, I think my best game's Raz, but um, who knows? <laughs> what about you, Maria? Yeah, I mean, I would say an eight game. I would say probably my best game is... 08, I think. I think that it's still a game that I think confuses a lot of people in terms of not really knowing when they can get that extra bet because they're quartering somebody or, you know, how to play the correct starting hands because you want to have the ability to scoop. And I think sometimes players just like that game because there's a lot of possibilities, but they end up, I think, putting in too many bets with really weak hands. So... Nice. Rubinho here with King High. Pre-move, just continuing to attack. Like you said, you know, just taking advantage of the fact that they have such a huge chip lead, putting a lot of pressure on, you know, pre-move, who was just trying to continue with the two overs in that spot. Yeah, definitely. And I think this is a big reason why I've done so well, because, you know, I, I'm not... I wouldn't say I'm like crazy well studied in any game or that that good i just understand um you know how to play a lot of spots in general and like chip dynamics where you know i've i've won a lot of tournaments just by like doing that yeah i feel like from my experience playing with you i i feel like you have a really good handle on game flow and you're really able to capitalize and take advantage of knowing when it's shifting in a certain direction and when you can be more aggressive or when you kind of need to lay back. Although most of the time you're just mostly very aggressive. <laughs> but once in a while, once in a while you put the brakes on. Yeah, pre-move taking the lead here. I, uh, I like his aggression. He's definitely a favorite, not only chips, but style at this point. Um, took a double barrel there at the 10-4. Troll opening with the ace queen suited, not going to get any takers. And obviously, you know, in a game like Limit Hold'em, you're not going to see very wide defense from the big blind that you would see in No Limit because, of course, you don't have, you know, the implied odds of potentially felting somebody for their whole stack in Limit that you do in No Limit. So there's really just not as much value in uh, defending really wide. Yeah, definitely. There's Annie's also not to consider. Um, I think I think one of the one of the things you know the viewers in general might want to like uh, think about, I guess, is uh, w when you're playing a game like how much you should you should bluff versus uh, versus like how tight you should play in it is typically like how frequently it goes to showdown, basically. So if it goes to showdown like at a really high frequency, then you should be bluffing like less often and then if it goes to showdown at a lower frequency then you can bluff more often so um yeah I, what, what would you say like the frequency and like how often you should be bluffing in limit hold'em would be i mean i think it's i i would say fairly low i think it's one of those things where i think if you I mean, I was seeing pre-move just do this, and it made me actually think it's right along the lines of what we're talking about now. You know, he's going to double barrel a lot, but then once somebody calls both flop and turn, then they're probably not going to fold river in limit hold'em. So at that point, I think if you're bluffing and you go two streets, I think you have to shut down on a bluff at a pretty high frequency on the river. Um, because at that point, I think the chances of it going to showdown, whether you, you bet or not, is going to be fairly high nice so play a little bit more solid especially given that there are less annies and less like in blood odds like you're saying yeah and i think right now that does seem to be pre-move strategy is you know maybe raise a little bit wider because they have such a big chip lead and then fire twice if they get called then they're going to shut down at the on the river but a lot of the times the players are folding on the turn, so it kind of makes this strategy really good for him. Definitely, yeah. He's he's certainly playing really well, but still still staying relatively within range. Yeah, and this is a clear three bet, I think. 
Yeah, clear three bet by the sevens and ace ten suited, too good and pretty much committed to this hand. Just 146k back. Wow, big action here. Yeah, going for it, hoping for the hoping for the six. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and yeah, unfortunately, that'll, that'll yeah, for XD, I think that that's definitely a fair play to four bet there with ace 10 suited. You're up against an opener like pre move who you know is going to be opening pretty wide. And yeah, sevens there is a, I think, on the button, but ace 10 suited just, just too good. Yeah, I played a lot with. XD89 LOL. <laughs> he, we, we play cash games together. I would say that, you know, going into this table, uh, I would have said he has the best chance. If they all had the same amount of chips, he, he has one of the best shots of winning because he's, he's very skillful. I played a lot of, he plays a lot of eight game and uh, he's definitely a very, very strong player. So I think, I think everybody's pretty happy to see him go that, that is left because he's a major threat. Yeah, just four players remaining now. We're flying through this final table. It's it's quite different uh, from last week. Yeah, this is, yeah. So at this point, um, yeah, I guess uh, trolling, trolling gen or whatever. Uh, he's, yeah, he's he's probably the uh, one of the less experienced players. And then the other three are quite a bit more experienced. Robin Ho being kind of in the middle, he's he's pro probably primarily a Hold'em player that just comes around and he's getting a lot better over the years, certainly. But uh, yeah, there uh, it's, it, it's that's what you get a lot whenever Scoop comes around. People just people just play all the tournaments, so it, it makes it really profitable and uh and a lot of fun. Get it? Yeah, mix. definitely. There's a lot of players, you know, going for leaderboard players who just want a shot to win a scoop obviously there's a lot of prestige that comes with that and so it is a good time i think for players who specialize in these mixed games i think to be playing because like you said there will be some no limit specialists just jumping in these mixed games big turn there yeah top pair for pre-move and we've got the broadway here for rubinho just Wondering, you know, I think in limit hold'em, fast playing is usually pretty good because, again, most players, if they can bet this type of flop and turn, they can, you know, withstand calling a raise. Yeah, you know, I think with free move there, he, he's playing a little bit fast, and he, that turn bet was a little bit loose. I, I wouldn't, you know, recommend that. We have a little, a little glitch. All right, moving into limit Omaha eight or better. This is your game. <laughs> Looks like a wheel for Nikino and uh, pre move with the flush. I'm sorry, Nikino with a flush. What do you do in these situations, Maria? Because you don't have much low potential. And uh, you got the king. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those I think you call one and decide on the turn. And obviously turning more equity with this flush draw is going to probably make it easier. But it doesn't have to face another bet on the Whoa. turn, fortunately. <laughs> big big river here. I think you got a value yeah. Yeah, you have the flush, but pre-move rivers the boat. So pretty unfortunate here, and no low possible. So really easy for pre-move to know that they've got the best of it. Yeah. Yeah, big cooler. Really good starting hand here for troll, and good flop as well, but. Facing a lot of aggressive action with the nut low from pre-move here, and wow, yeah, it's everything's going really quick, you know. Um, another big hand. Hmm. 
and at low draw doesn't materialize yet and it's a little frustrating for troll I think you know you put quite a few bets in pre and you flop the nut low don't have really much of a high hand to go with it yeah I would say given that troll played so quickly there and he, he played the hand pretty well he, that he probably considers this to be one of his best games um Yeah, normally, you know, this type of hand by pre-move wouldn't be an open, but obviously on the button with the chip lead from early position, I, I think that would be a fold, though. Yeah, that's definitely, I mean, everything's moving so fast. I think the best thing to just talk about at this point is really just the chip dynamics where, you know, you have a sh troll short stack getting half here. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, people got to play a little bit more cautious. I mean, Ro Robin Ho is probably in a spot where like he doesn't really want to make too many mistakes here because he, he wants to make sure the troll gets knocked out so he gets the pay jump. Um, so being a little bit more cautious on that stack size is probably big regardless of what play, game you're playing. Yeah, and it's always nice, you know, when you are the short stack, though, to maybe move into a game where it's an anti-game instead of you having to pay the big blind. You know, you're always, like, hoping, okay, like, let me see, can I get to maybe the stud games before a blind game? Yeah, definitely, and that's, that's, but if you think you're, you know, you're really, really good at one of the games, then you kind of just have to, I think you're better off just, because you know where you're at, right? You just have to play that game as fast as you can, I think. Um, big double. A little double up, sure. yeah. Very much needed there. Wow. This is kind of a tough one. With, uh, it's really just a check call down here. You got, you got all the pairs, but no low. It's kind of a brutal... Brutal run out for Robin Ho. He could get away here, but it's tough. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's another element of these limit games where, you know, I was kind of joking when I said, you know, there's going to be a lot of bluffing, but there's not no bluffing. You know, people think, oh, well, could I really get somebody to fold for one big bet on the river? And I mean, the answer is definitely yes. Like there will be hands where you will see people, you know, bluff for just one bet and get a fold. And I think that's one of the things that I think people don't talk about enough is even though somebody could be getting eight to one on a call on the end, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to call just because the price is that good. Yeah. I mean, just, just like, yeah. And, and like I was saying earlier, you know, I, I would say that Omaha high low is a game that goes to showdown at a pretty high frequency. So you really need to stay within your range. Like people that play like seven, eight, nine, ten, and a lot of the middling cards, they're, they're, they're not going to do very well because the hands just, we, we see a showdown. We see, you know, everybody has to show their, show their cards at the end. So you can't really bluff that much in this game. And it's very, it's a very flopped based hand based game. Um, but like you said, you know, you, you can definitely get people to fold in the river as a bluff if they, if they miss and it doesn't, and then you get pretty good odds on that, on that bet. Pretty big cooler here for, uh, Interesting hand. People look at these hands and they're like, who has what? You know? It, it's... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Flush over flush. Hello. Yep. Yeah, and if some people are having trouble following just because the action's going really quickly, in, it'll show in the chat what they win with. But especially in these multi-way pods, it could be hard to kind of keep up with. Definitely, this is a this is quite a loose open. Uh, 
you can kind of do whatever you want in a way when you have such a big chip lead on the field. But I don't, I don't love this open because you're you're opening into a short stack that's going to call you at a high frequency. So your hand's going to go to showdown a little bit too often. Um, yeah, troll on a spot here. Um, I like to fold. Yeah, I think blind aggression kind of wins in, in this spot whenever you're pre-move. Uh, people miss, you you just win, which is nice to have a big stack. And does end what, up was... making a straight on the river. Yeah, it's kind of like you're saying, you know, if you have such a big chip stack, you can open pretty wide f from the button, but also, you know, in other positions as well and if you don't flop anything you can kind of you know navigate post pretty easily but you also find a lot of good spots to put a lot of pressure on your opponents as well you know just betting on the draw kind of surprised of this check call here with the kings it's, it's um yeah you're it's just really really bad flop and it slams the range of uh you know, a button three better. But. Yeah, it's kind of hard to continue when you don't have a backup for a low, and also there's not a lot of good runouts for your hand. Yeah. Pre move. Chopping that with the straight for the high end and Aquino with the low there. Yeah, so like you were saying earlier, um, it would probably be in the best interest of Troll to get to a stud game. Even though he may be less familiar with those games, you're just going to have a way better chance of like doubling up. Because like, posting such a large percentage of your stack in the big blind is pretty detrimental you pretty much have to go with it right so whenever you grab an annie from everyone else you know the multiplier that you could you could get to is uh a lot of the time a lot of the times higher looks Get like all controls all in oh no chop it up oh chop it up yeah it's quick it's quick <laughs> Yeah, and that's kind of the other thing is, you know, in 08 when you're short, there's not going to be a lot of opportunities for you to scoop. Like, you're going to be chopping quite a bit. So you really want to find the opportunity where you're in a game where you can actually double through. Well, in that situation, they did end up scooping. All right. This is my game. Yeah, here you go. So in Raz, you know, the high uh, the high card is the bring-in, and Ace plays low, so that is why you see the bring-in coming from the Jack of Troll there. Yeah, these are interesting spots, because, like, Robin Hood could have elected to 3-bet or call in the situation given Troll stack. Um, wow. Got a flip here, pretty much. Wow, br brutal, brutal miss. And you know, Raz, all the stud games is really a, a big part of it is, you know, representing your board essentially, right? Like you could have paired in Raz, but your opponent doesn't know that if you, you have two cards down that they aren't able to see. So a lot of times you just kind of have to bet your board if you're the favorite. Absolutely. You know, um, I think a, a big surprise to a lot of people is that Raz, you know, is a more of a bluffing game than people realize. And uh, the showdown frequency is like quite low in comparison to a lot of other games. So, uh, yeah, but whenever, you know, when you, you're running on short stacks, we're gonna go, you're going to go to showdown a lot. So folding a little bit earlier is typically better. Big yeah, being there Robin with Hood. the double up. Yeah.
Yeah, this should be a, a bust out here. Because they're both the same stack, so. Yeah, and both players with fairly strong hands. Yeah, this is, brick this is it. Yeah. yeah, big brick on fifth, but still two more cards to come. Yep. That was a pretty much a coin flip the whole way. Yeah, and Troll just on fumes now. Oh, <laughs> a full house is not good in this game, guys. That is not what you want. Good game yeah. to troll there. Yeah, next game. Next game, it would be a little bit better. <laughs> that is the one thing that I, when I would play a game live, is you have to pay attention if, you know, the stud games are next to each other when you're like, okay, wait, are we playing Raj or stud high? Because clearly the opposite of in terms of starting hands. Yeah, definitely. You, you can... You can do a lot of pump fakes and act like you didn't know what game it was too to mess with your opponents as well. <laughs> Not that I do those things, yeah. but I've seen it done. Uh, you know, <laughs> Calvin, you, you let the viewers in on all the tricks, okay? They they need to know what to watch out for. <laughs> wow. This is an interesting one. I mean, Robin Hood is definitely going to call here. Ooh, big brick. Wow. Do yeah. you bluff this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's tough, right? Like board representation, you're showing two pair oh, and you, do, you go for it and get gets away with it. Just It's tough. It's tough to get those bluffs through, yeah. <laughs> that was big. <laughs> that one, that that's a fun one. That's a fun one. I, I mean, pre-move is just sitting there being like, no way they're bluffing. Like, they know I could see they have two pairs, yeah. so I don't think they're uh, going to take this spot. They must have it. Yeah. Nice little level there yeah. by Robin. Yeah. It's always kind of fun. See, guys? There is bluffing in <laughs> limit games. There is folding for a big bet. <laughs> Yeah, they're not often, but that they work, you know, when you get such good odds. Yeah, and here, you know, Primo starting with, yeah, starting with aces in the hole, but again, you know, still with two other low cards, still really good hand to have. And again, your opponents can't see that you started with a pair in the hole, so. Mm hmm so yeah, this is when when you have a seven, you usually pair the seven less frequently. So that's one of the good things about raising with a pair in Raz. Not to say that it's a good thing to raise with a pair in Raz, but when your pair when your pair cards up, there's less of a chance than you're going to get another seven, which is exactly what happened there. But. Yeah, I mean, See, Robin like, seems like, to be trying. Yeah, go ahead. This is an example. Yeah, I mean, he's play he's playing cautious, but like you know, this is this is one of those situations where he raised with sixes, just like I was saying, and then he got a good run out, and he didn't pair with six, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, after that bluff by Robin, it's like I'm rooting for him, but he can't seem to get anything going, you know, just fluctuating with that short stack yeah it's tough I mean these are this is when you're on a short stack you, you can't you try not to commit too many too many chips to a par you're not willing to go with you don't really have a lot of wiggle room but yeah he'll probably just fold here I mean this is pretty you can't really do a lot when you have a short stack like this like I was saying so everybody's playing pretty well so far. I haven't seen anything. Um, yeah, they're all three pretty strong players.
pretty move with slightly better hand right now. Not so oh. much <laughs> now. Yeah, that yeah, was, you know, one of the... Go ahead. Oh, no, no, please. Uh, what I was saying is that um, pre-move just, like, snap called there. And I think that's a little bit... You know, like, you're at a big final table. Uh, you have a big time bank, you know. Just, just, just... Think about some of the, some of the spots on the big bet streets a little bit a little bit earlier because he he had very there's situations where he had like no equity and like you know in most situations he had little equity but he just he just he's playing a little bit fast uh, but you know he's he's really good though and uh, he's keeping the aggression on he's doing a lot of things right that's for sure but uh, summer playing a little bit too fast I think he could slow it down a little bit. Yeah, still betting there with the jack low with one to come. Surprise, no defend there. Most people would defend. Yeah, you think Nakino feels a little bit handcuffed just because they want Robin to bust and they don't necessarily want to play in in a game like Raz, which does play bigger than some of the other games, play a lot of hands in a, that are marginal spots against pre-move? Yeah, I mean, that seems to be... Oh, this is a good check-raise opportunity. Oh, wow, he didn't check-raise it. See, like, again there, he just snap-checked, and, you know, he could have check-raised, given that uh, he almost always has the best hand in that situation. It's just another... Yeah, but I mean, his natural instincts are really good, though, and he's keeping. But yeah, like you said, though, yeah, he, he you know, people are gonna play cautious as a middle stack, and that's a, that's a definitely a good move. Wait until Robin Hill gets gets uh gets knocked out is definitely the, the smart a smart conservative play. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like sometimes players can go on autopilot a little bit in these limit games with the pace. And like you said, when you are at a final table, maybe it is important to just take a couple of seconds off of your time bank to think through certain spots. And obviously, you know, calculating equities in Raz is pretty hard and most people don't aren't familiar enough with enough spots to really do it on the fly. So, you know, in that hand where you were talking about where you wanted to see pre-move take some more time it was a spot where you with one card to come you're not a hundred percent sure you know how big of a favorite your opponent might be so even though you're gonna just mm -hmm. roughly calculate it in your head there's no way most players would be able to know instantaneously if that should have been a call or a fold on six yeah i mean i've i've played a significant pro i mean a lot, a lot, a lot of hands of Raz. I mean, I've played, I don't even know how many. And, you know, I, so I, I, I kind of know most, most spots pretty quickly, but, you know, it's, it's still very difficult to just, like, know your equity in, in that situation. And, and, and he, I think he got a couple spots wrong. You know, he has so many chips and, you know, he has such a big lead and he's taking such high aggression that, like, it doesn't matter if he makes a few mistakes, but, uh, but yeah, he could he could play a little bit better. Um, surprisingly, he, he's done he's done a lot more things right than he's done wrong. That's for sure. Moving but. into limit stud here, we got Nakino with a pair of fours, and Robin has improved to queens. Two pair on on six here for Nakino's. This is a check for sure. Boy, that'd be a sick bluff. <laughs> you just want to see him go for it again. I mean, it would have worked a two lot bluffs, of the time. Yeah, for sure. Two That's bluffs uh, in, in a 10-minute span is very impressive in, in limit games, for sure. Yeah, no, I mean, that bluff would have worked, I think, because he has a low two-pair, and Robin Ho is repping high two-pair. And, uh, but... 
you know, people people play really quick, and I think that's one of the things. Like just just balancing your timing and, but everybody's playing fast, and I think that's one of the things that pre move is is doing is he's playing really fast to try to force other people to stay in flow with him, which is like kind of the control that he has over the table, and it's something that I do as well. It's like if you always are making quick decisions, the other person feels like they need to move at your pace, and Ro Robin Hood's pretty good, you know, but uh, there's a few spots that uh. He probably is a little bit unfamiliar with, you know. Everyone is. No, not too many people are experienced at these tables, but yeah. And looks like we just lost Rubinho there in third place, finishing with a payout of about sixteen thousand five hundred. And you know, again, just couldn't really get much going off of that stack today, but did give us a little bit of entertainment with that one bluff in Raz with two pairs showing that got through. So thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, he played, he played great for sure. And, uh, he, 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 he got a pretty bad card distribution and, and run outs for sure. But, uh, yeah, he, he did the best he could, I'd say. Yeah. So for a lot of these, viewers were like this is moving so fast well this is eight game and you're gonna see a rotation of these eight games and again in limit we've just noticed that the pacing and the timing is gonna go a lot faster but we are currently playing limit stud and obviously in stud you start with two face down and then one face up and then there's going to be several rounds of betting to follow in the end Players each have seven cards, their own board. There's not a shared community board like there is in Hold'em. And the seventh card is face down. Yeah, everything's moving pretty fast. So, like, you know, in stud, you want to just... The, typically, pairs are going to do a lot better than draws. And, uh... Yeah, just aggression is usually going to win whoever bets... The big bet street is is gonna whoever bets it first. So, I I you know I think whenever you you think about uh, it's almost first off it's almost pointless to like commentate on each hand because they're, they're just gonna be rolling and moving. But uh, so as you know as a, a standard Texas Hold'em player, you know you you have that guy that old guy at the table that like he calls your uh, your raise from the big blind and then he just like donks out on the flop with like total trash or whatever and then you're like okay this guy's bluffing almost for sure and then you call him or you raise him and he's just like gonna give up and he's gonna fold now that concept is from stud and like in stud that's actually very standard and a good play and i think that's what people don't realize is that you know when you take somebody that's played stud their whole life and then put them in a game like hold them they're just gonna think that that they play the same way right but they don't and then you notice that, but that's kind of where that thought process comes from. So it's definitely um, when you play all the games, you can kind of relate what how a person thinks about the, the games they play. It's like, okay, if I specialize in stud, then they're just going to assume that most games play that way, and it's not a it's not the case in other games, but it certainly is that it is that case. So um, in stud, you kind of want to play like that that guy that you may think is like an old fish that's a grandpa or something like that. It's just making all these random donk leads. It's because you just, you just, you bet based on the board texture change. Right. No, I, I definitely don't think I've ever thought of it that way, but it makes a lot of sense because it's kind of like, Oh, well, if I have a big hand, I'm going to bet it because in stud, like you said, you know, if you have a pair showing, then obviously you're going to be leading and in No Limit Holds Them, we will see situations where people aren't slow playing maybe when they should, and we're like, oh, well, why are they leading with such a, you know, with the best hand when it's not as obvious that they have the best hand here as it is in stud? Yeah, definitely. So, like, like you said, some people just have a big hand and they bet it, and then you're like, why would you do that? That's, like, such a, you know, whatever, you know, the way you think about it. Or if you have nothing and they just, like, bluff that, too, and it's yeah it's relatable to stud i mean they, i mean i wasn't you know you're you're more a little bit more old school than i am yeah, I, I i started playing in like maybe 2010 or something like that right so like i i wasn't around for any of these old days but i really just enjoy all the games and i want to learn them all so 
Yeah. I am a little more old school than you, but I am not old, Calvin. We're just going <laughs> to. <laughs> no, but I, I, I started playing in 2005. So, yes, I, I, was, I was around. And I am actually probably a lot older than you. So, it's okay. I wouldn't Don't say a lot me. older. But, yeah, you, you've played all the games. You've definitely been playing the games longer than I have. And uh, you're, you're definitely tuned. Well, I was saying, you know, on last week's replay stream that when you live in like somewhere in L.A., when Commerce is, you know, 20 minutes away, places like that play a lot more mixed games than other local card rooms for people. You know, Commerce is one of those places where a lot of mixed games started, a lot of games were invented, and certainly there's a big enough pool of players that are interested in playing a bunch of different games, whereas for a lot of players, they might not get exposed to a lot of these games just because you're not going to see your local card room spreading Badoogie or, or Deuce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you're, you're definitely very talented at uh, every game in general. Um, yeah, much, much more than I think definitely any female, in my opinion. Uh, and then... You know, with the, with the guys, there's just they're just too competitive. I I mean, it's 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 tough to beat somebody that was willing to dedicate everything in their whole life to that thing. And you know, it's yeah, it's yeah. Would you say that there's still money to be made in mixed games though? Like when Scoop comes around, obviously there's opportunities for people to play games that they haven't before. But normally speaking, you're not really gonna find a lot of players with a lot of experience under their belts in in a format like eight game, right? You might find a stud specialist. You might find a no limit hold'em specialist, but you're not really going to find someone who is as well versed in all of the different games. So you can, you know, capitalize on the people that are playing very mediocre in seven out of the eight games, basically. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's there's a lot of opportunity. I mean, there's even opportunity in just like whatever individual game, especially during like the World Series or any of the series that's come ar that come around. You know, I mean, I, that's why I've always really enjoyed playing Scoop. For for me personally, I'd rather go really hard for you know a couple weeks and be able to play all the different games and be able to play the World Series and because people, you know. A lot of people play these games just for the fame or whatever, and you can, you can. De there's definitely a lot of opportunities. So, like anybody, I think, can spend a lot of time studying one game, have that be their game, and then certainly make money uh, in in the, around these series, around the World Series, and and uh, even even potentially in you know, I mean, definitely in like regular tournaments throughout the week. Cash games are getting a bit tougher, you know, I would say, but uh, it's certainly it's certainly beatable, but. Uh, yeah, there's still money to be made in poker for sure. And if you if you wanna if you wanna study, practice, switching the game up to stud high low here it seems like. Yeah, so, so stud high low gonna be a split pot game similar to you know 08 where you can play for the low and for the high. Obviously, again, the best starting hands are always gonna be the ones where you have the possibility to win both the low and the high. Yeah, it's it's a definitely a very different dynamic whenever you're playing heads up than you would full ring. And in full ring stud high low, you typically want to go with like multi way hands where you maybe have an ace as well, where you can get maybe two pair in a low, a straight in a low, a flush in a low. Uh, but definitely have that low possibility with potential like ace as a as a top as like a potential two pair or a top pair. Uh, but when you're playing heads up. You kind of just want to play almost you're almost playing stud and you just want to get like the best high hand because a low hand doesn't always come in um so i would i would value high hands and whenever you're playing shorter handed i value high hands much they're much more valuable i would say yeah definitely if you have a very strong one-way hand then you have to kind of go full speed ahead with it whereas as you said, in full ring, if you only have a strong one-way hand in your multi-way, then you're not necessarily going to be the most aggressive player with that hand. Yeah. Wow. That was, I feel like that was such a rush of like so much action so quick and so <laughs> many box bust outs. And now they, they want to, this one, one of them wants to skips the break. 
<laughs> I was like, yeah, no, please take a break, guys, so we can catch up on on some questions. But um, yeah, yeah, no, wow. it looks like pre pre moves gonna do the uh, diligent thing of taking a break, guys. I feel like you guys need to slow it down a little bit, th a little bit there. Um, <laughs> So some players wanted to know, Calvin, how you became such a crusher. Obviously, if anybody's Googled you or looked up your Hendon mob, they know you have quite the impressive resume, both live and online, you know, multiple scoop titles, et cetera. So how did you get into the game and get to be the legend that uh, you are, Calvin? Yeah, I think with any, any, <laughs> <laughs> I think with anybody, uh, whatever they really enjoy doing and whatever they're naturally like pretty talented at, I think if they just like go towards that and try to like really specialize in that is, is kind of the key to success. So for, for me, it happened to be like, like a little bit of psychology, like odds, little statistics into a little bit of intuition. And then like, I really enjoyed like, you know, betting in general and, and, and money and games. So uh, this made the most sense for me. So it's just, I think, you know, if, if you like people or whatever, whatever you really enjoy doing, I think, try to do that thing, uh, regardless of what it is. And, you know, for me, fortunately, this, this happened to, this happened to kind of be it in general. So, um, but yeah, I just, I, I worked really hard, I would say. And, and I think the big difference between nowadays and back in the day, um, you can get online and learn just about anything and then you can just get so many hours in. So like with online poker, you know, I played you know, maybe you, you, it, with live, you can only play one table and you have to like, it's pretty slow, right? But online, you can play at least 20 times more tables at once. Like I could play 20 tables and then like 14 hours a day and they're like whatever you, you want to do basically and just get the multiplier of that is like one day is equivalent to a month experience or two months experience maybe uh, of live. So just, I, I personally hit it really hard for a couple of years when I, when I could, when I was younger and then uh, picked up a lot of experience and um, yeah, it got, I got, I got better through doing more than actually uh, studying. And then I just picked it up naturally, I would say, but um, I watched, I watched people play and I watched some replayers as well. Not, not, not necessarily other people, commentating on the replayers i would just look like this replayer you're watching now i mean this is the, one of the best ways to get good is to just see the cards that they play and why they play them and the people that are successful and put yourself in the shoes of every single person and that's i would say that that was the best thing for me and that's how i like to coach people is just replay these this exact thing you know scoop replayer final table all the games whatever game you like and just watch the pros play pick it up as you go yeah, I would say that when people ask me how best to learn, I always said hands-on experience is so important. And like you said, getting this visual of being able to see everybody's cards and then trying to figure out and get into their mind of, okay, why is it that they're doing what they're doing? You kind of miss those days where poker wasn't as solved and there wasn't all of these programs out there and assistance that people rely on now because it takes the fun out of kind of trying to figure it out on your own. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's in, you know, f for me, if I come back, I, I haven't played po too much poker recently, but, uh, you know, I, I enjoy the mix because they're not, they're not as, you know, there's not as many nerds that are just spending their whole life studying, you know, a game. And it's just like, wow, it's pretty tough to beat a robot essentially. So yeah, these games are a lot more fun. Yeah, definitely these games are a lot farther from being solved than No Limit Hold'em is. What about you? What's your, uh, Maria, what's your, uh, what's your brief story of how you got into poker? I mean, you could have gone into a lot of things. Yeah, I kind of was similar to you. You know, I grew up really enjoying card games and I was always very competitive as a child. And so I think I gravitated towards anything that kind of exposed me to that or had elements of that. And um, it started with playing bridge with my grandfather when I was young. And then in college, I discovered poker and it wasn't something that I immediately was like, oh yeah, I can do this for a living. I never thought of it that way. It was just something I really enjoyed playing. 
But when there was that opportunity and that opening to actually do it for a living, you kind of were like, oh, shoot, I could play a card game for a living. This sounds fun. Why not? And luckily it worked out for me. So really on a whim to decide to, to do it for a living for sure. <laughs> yeah. Someone in chat wanted to know that is there going to be another final table that we will be showing? And the answer is yes. After this final table concludes, you guys are going to want to stick around because there's going to be a five card pot limit Omaha six max progressive knockout. I needed to take a breath in between all of that. That was a long <laughs> one. So that one will be fun just because PKOs are always fast, furious. There's that extra little dynamic of knocking people out for the bounty, so. Yeah, definitely. So the bring in's gonna be the low card showing, which is the five of hearts of pre-move. And now Nikina with king queen showing, the high ends up leading the betting rounds after the bring-in. That was interesting. I don't know if I would have called that street. Yeah, again, like you said, it's just one of those scenarios where you would think players would take a little more time just to figure out where they're at, what their equity is going to be. Um, it's not always just an auto call in those scenarios on a draw. Mm -hmm. Pre-move now leading, blocking the spades. So even though it looks like a little bit scary that Nikino has three spades up, when you have a few spades in your hand, feel a little bit more comfortable, obviously, that your opponent doesn't have the flush quite yet. Wow. Big hand yeah. <laughs> to pre-move. That's about what you want to see when you have rolled fives. So one of the things about, you know, rolled fives is that it's pretty difficult to make a straight without a five. So, um, wow, he hits a five in the end Do it for half. <laughs> Yeah, kind of unfortunate, you know, heads up, even in stud eight, when you start rolled up, you're probably thinking you're going to scoop. Yeah, so one of the one of the things that uh, I think the viewers may not realize, you know, in my opinion, it, ace, and the ace would be like the best card to start out with, uh, but the second best card is actually a, a five, because the straight possibilities, you, you need a five or a ten to make a straight, and like if you just start out with one from the beginning, then it's a bit easier to get you know, up or down with, uh, with that card. So rolled five is certainly like rolled fives are, I think they're better than rolled sixes, you know, because that the same, that exact reason pretty much. Um, so that's, that's a really, really, really big hand, obviously in any game, but definitely stud I low. Pre-move with the bring-in. And, you know, in these situations when you just have a king showing, a lot of the times, you know, you don't have much to go with it, but you could also just call the bring-in. You don't always have to complete the bring-in. Play. Yeah, definitely very aggressive, knowing that they are showing the <laughs> pair of threes. <laughs> I like that play a lot, actually, for by pre-move. He, he got unfortunate that, you know, uh, Kino, he uh, rivered a, rivered a straight there, straight, but that yeah. would have worked. That would have worked, actually, what he just right. did there, I think. 
because it looks like he has trip threes. Yeah, so, and um, potentially a low draw as well, so really mm -hmm. easy to have a scooper, potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, he pre, pre moves a little bit higher level than I realized, especially in at the stud games in general. I mean, that was a... Pre-move, yeah. Making moves. Yeah, going, <laughs> going for it. <laughs> Should be a big hand. All right, so uh, Kino's definitely been balancing here. Every time a bring in's happened with pre move, uh, he's he's just called. So now he's you know doing it again to disguise the fact that he's yeah now he's you know putting that raise in really in a really really good spot. Um, yeah, going for the big bet raise street, but <laughs> bad that was brutal. Bad run out. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I like seeing that, you know, people talk about being balanced of course and no limit hold them, but I like situations like that where we can show the viewers that you can also find spots to be balanced in these type of games as well. And especially heads up, wait for the big bet street to raise with the kings instead of just completing the action right away. Yeah, if, if, you know, some of the viewers have noticed, he's been basically calling every time in those situations. All right, switching it up to hold him. No limit hold him. Okay, guys. I know you guys have probably been waiting this whole time for a game that you guys understand really well, and the action is going to slow down maybe just a little bit <laughs> because people can be playing for stacks now. So... It's interesting because in the eight game type of lineup that you won't see in horse because there are games where people can risk their whole stack, it could be quite annoying to maybe chip up a lot in the limit games and then all of a sudden get into a really unfortunate cooler spot in no limit hold'em, you know? Yeah, a lot of a lot of good players, they try to avoid these games, so it'd be interesting to see the style uh, that these guys want to, and the approach they want to take because... You know, the majority of people that play a game like Gate Game, they're they're not trying to take big risk in, in a game where you can lose your whole stack. So, um, yeah, but, you know, sometimes you can abuse that. And, and I think that's one of the things that, um, uh, you know, some of the better players do well is, you, you know, you try to become aware of who really doesn't want to get knocked out and hold them because then you just go for it really hard. And I think that's one of the also like advantages of good you know good players to, to know who's good at what game and like what games they feel more comfortable uh gambling on in, in general people play looser and they play more hands and they and they're more comfortable in the more comfortable in a game they understand better so uh typically playing more aggressive in a game that you under understand better as well and then that other people may not understand yeah, I think someone who r really comes to mind about, you know, what we're talking about is actually Michael Mizraki because I noticed anytime I played in these type of eight game formats, he especially in the in the no limit holds on portion is going to target all of the mixed game specialists because he knows that the mixed game specialists aren't here for no limit holds them. They're not trying to play a high variance style in that game and risk their whole stack when their edge is going to be in the other games. And I've seen him get really out of line during the no limit holds on portion and it works really well. And of course, everybody knows Grinders won, you know, the 50K Players Championship at the World Series, where people might be like, "But I didn't think Grinder played the other games that well." Well, I think he definitely used these big bet games to his advantage. Definitely, that's a great example of of a person. And I try to, I try to, uh, I try to play similar to to him. Actually, a funny story. One time I was playing uh, a a uh, Hold'em. 1500 PL or PKO at the World Series, and I was playing a lot of hands at the table, and he, him and I hadn't played too much together. And after playing with him for like two hours, and we were batting, battling a ton, he was like, "Man, like, I've I've never I've never played with anybody that's played more hands with, than than I have than, than you know <laughs> than you basically." And I was like, "Oh man, that's a big compliment." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. grinder not used to getting a taste of his own medicine at the table yeah, yeah 
you know, he's 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 awesome. He's he's an animal, and definitely I've trying to mimic 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 the style of some somebody like him. So it's uh, yeah, he's he's really good. So it's Big cool. pot pre here with two not very good hands, but some playability right now for both players. Pre move with the flush draw. Aquino with the straight draw, trying to realize their equity by checking back, but pre-move just aggression, sheer aggression, taking that one down. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, pre-move is willing to go for it a lot more, and uh, Kino is, is is probably a little bit more cautious. As, as you know, it's probably standard, but. The aggression wins. And now pre-move showing up at the river with just five high. I mean, if if Nikino didn't bet there, I would have expected pre-move to try to bluff in that spot just because you have no showdown value. Definitely a possibility. Just smashing oh, the flop. <laughs> mm hmm He'll be able to get a bet or two out of him here, probably. Yeah, and I would say maybe or two now, considering the nine pairs on the turn, and just makes Nakino feel like their hand's a little bit stronger. Obviously, didn't want to see a club. There were some bad turn cards, but the nine pairing, actually, one of the better cards for pre-move to get more action, Whoa. but doesn't. <laughs> so I'm a little bit surprised about the fold there, but you know, if you, if you, if your hold'em is not your game, then you know I, I don't mind it. But another thing that I would probably do if you feel really outclassed is probably should limp more, probably should play a little bit slower, and you should try to like just make this try to make the spots feel a little bit bigger. But you know, maybe he doesn't care. He just shoved the a six off there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Randomized aggression, maybe. I don't know. That, yeah. was, that was interesting. I yeah. mean, still fairly deep, you know, over 50 bigs effective, so. Yeah, pre-move's pre -moves taken a lot of three bets, a, a lot more than, you know, the average person. We got a chop pot situation here. How often do you think it actually does chop? I mean, the way that Nakino is playing, I would say that not very often because it feels like they're going to fold to this turn bet, but they do have a straight draw to go with it. But it, without it, I would have just said that pre-move would be able to take it away. But at this point, I think both players probably pretty happy to show it down. Mm -hmm. So we got PLO next. Uh, the actual game should be coming up pretty soon. Do you think it ends a lot here in PLO? It probably does, just because it's such a gamble game. <laughs> oh, pre-move, just getting so out of line with their three bets. Just taking, you know, all of their worst hands and three betting them. But this one obviously will not get through. Guys, I know you wanted to hear the Chop Pot song, but Calvin and I didn't really rehearse it beforehand and because, you know, I don't, I don't want to ruin Calvin's experience by forcing him to do the song unrehearsed. Usually, you know, me and James and Joe, we have a little more time to work through it, but... <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys have that. <laughs> I don't love Chop Pots anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and you don't want to sing a song where you don't believe in the lyrics, you know, Calvin. I wouldn't make you do that. It's you don't love chop pot, so I like to see somebody get bluffed off the chop. <laughs> 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 More entertaining for me, for sure. So yeah, I mean, what are they playing for like 7k, 6500? I'd say it's a little bit, a little bit low for them to really care about chopping. 
So, um, when you play a yeah, 1K and, this... and you're only playing Go ahead. And at this point, wouldn't you think that pre-move probably feels, by the way that they're playing, that they have a pretty decent edge? You know, they feel like maybe Nikino's getting a, playing a little more of a passive style. Um, yeah, you know, it's hard to know, though, because some people just have a style, and they play that style, and they don't know whether they're, you know, better or not than the player, but they, they just this is just how they play, kind of, right? So it's hard to know really what's going on in somebody's head, because... But yeah, but by definitely by the way that he's playing, I, I would say that he's pretty careless about a lot of things. He's definitely giving that <laughs> loot, no doubt. Yeah, exuding the confidence of being like every yeah. spot, I'm just gonna attack and see if mm. you will play back at me, basically. Yeah, definitely. Bottom pair against middle pair, and now both players turn a flush draw to go with it. Pretty standard stuff. See if he goes for the mall. He does it. He doesn't <laughs> care. He's not. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna open the button with seven deuce off, when it's okay, some players might give it up. Then, yeah, clearly you, you're not gonna find a lot of spots where you want to just give your opponent free chips. Mm. All right, here we go. PLO. So many possibilities. <laughs> Alright, so this is what what I, I'm surprised Kino didn't do in the last game. Is I'm surprised he didn't just start limping more hands. Because I, I would say that his, his style is a little bit less aggressive. And it's a little bit, you know, a little bit, I, not necessarily scared. But, like, he's, he's the person that's playing cautious because the other person is way more aggressive. So you just divert to that style as a nat natural, like... That's and that's the right move to do, but he's he's kind of getting owned in in a few spots, so he should probably just try to make the pot smaller. Basically, um, it's definitely a good strategy. Yeah, especially you know in PLO when equities run a lot closer than they do in No Limit Hold'em, you want to be able to see a lot of flops and hopefully make and connect with some of those speculative starting hands because you're not going to get dealt a monster necessarily, but you you want to try to realize the equity that you can potentially have in post. Yeah, you know when you're faced against an opponent that's like. Uh significantly more aggressive than you, then you just want to see more hands to try to realize your equity rather than get play really big inflated plots and then um, just have to like you're probably gonna you're probably gonna lose more pots. So the pots you do win, you want them to be bigger than the ones you lose. Um, and that's the only thing that I'm kind of disagreeing with. Like my counter as uh, Kino would be because I've been in situations even though I'm even though I'm very aggressive, I've been in situations where you play somebody that's just kind of unaware of like starting hands or starting ranges or no no know, knows how to play the game and he's just firing and firing and, and just kind of like a really aggressive whale and I've taken the role of, of being less aggressive and uh yeah maybe if I was playing pre move right now that's that's the role that I would that I would I think adjust and naturally adapt to to, to, to taking and playing. I haven't seen that gear from you personally, Calvin, but I'm gonna take your word for it. I believe that you do. <laughs> have that gear just not when i've been at the table because i tell people this story a lot you know in personal settings when people talk about the first time that we met because we've been friends for a long time and i will never forget because you bluffed me off jacks you like three bet me pre uh -huh. you fired two barrels post and i folded and even though everybody knows and everybody hates Jax, and they talk about how hard they are to play. If I knew then what I know now about your game, Calvin, I would not have folded Jax under any circumstances. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad. Yeah, I feel bad. I, I bluffed you there. <laughs> well, you definitely shouldn't feel bad. I, I just feel like I should have known better. But Yeah, maybe. Well, it's, it was the start of a... Good relationship, I guess. <laughs> <Gotta try. laughs> yeah, it's it, it's a good story. I don't I don't hold a grudge. Uh, pre move here with the 
double suited jacks and now has top pair. Nikino also has ace jack though. Interesting hand. Well, he's got the gutter, so he's probably going to at least call. Yeah, I think this is kind of where we determine just how close to the vest that Nakino is going to play in this spot. You know, you can't necessarily keep folding to these double barrels by an aggressive player when you have some equity to improve as well. Should probably go check check here, I would assume. Kino going to three bet with kings here. Yeah. If he, if he decides to take a small stab, he should he should snap to get it down. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to open it up for pre-move to, to take it away from you by, by checking <laughs> when you have range advantage. Kino with straight draw, pre-move with a pair, now two pair nines and fours. Big turn for Kino, I'd say, for turns and open in a yeah, straight draw. It now improves to queens and fours, which is better to pair than pre-move sevens and deuces. We're definitely worthy of the value bet. Ooh, big hand here, potentially. Yeah, Nikino flopping two pair. But Premium also has that gut shot straight draw to go with the Kings. So not going to yeah, get it... him off of this hand too easily. Oh, whoa. Just dumps it. Oh. All right, Just then. Dump. I mean, Pretty I guess surprised. that's one of the... Me too, but I think maybe that's one of the plus sides for Premove when you know that your opponent's been playing so passively that you are able to get away when they show aggression finally is as Nakino, you're not going to get a lot of action but maybe you can end up leveling your opponent and using that to your advantage later on of course yeah i mean equity is in that spot he, you know he could have hit a three uh to counterfeit him he could have hit uh, a gutter to make the straight he could have hit a king and then he could have got another card that that paired the board that counterfeit him as well so his equity there was actually like maybe like i don't know 33 percent or something like that so he might have been getting the right odds but um you know i think that he just thinks that his blind aggression and is just going to win at sh no showdown so he, these aren't risks that he really wants to take is what it is what it appears but yeah, equity, here though. we see. The, yeah, here we see aces are still best, but really scary board. Obviously, not a board that you want to be betting aces uh, for value in Omaha or Hold'em. River the deuce there. He backdoored ten two. The Doyle. 
I remember when I first started playing poker and people would have, there was all these names for different hands and I would be like, what are you guys talking about? I have no idea. You just like slowly end up learning them as you go, but you're like, what, what's the Doyle? Yeah. Yeah. There's so many at this point. I kind of just <laughs> go with like rhyming them or something <laughs> rather than like, give me uh, an example. I don't know. Like, like people call like King Seven Kevin or whatever, right? It's, yeah. It sounds like King Seven, right? And then you can just <laughs> further extend that to like anything. Like Jack Eight would be like Jate, you know? <laughs> Got the Jate. <laughs> it's like when people, uh, when two people are dating in Hollywood and they shorten their, like they combine their names. So it's like when Brad and Angelina were dating, it's Brangelina. But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like a flush here for pre-move. So yeah, there's a pre-move check back there with the flush. I think you know what what we're seeing a lot from pre-move in PLO at least is that when he ha when he has he's kind of playing more of a flip-flop style. So flip-flop would be betting when you have a really big hand and then whenever you have like nothing and then kind of checking the middling hands so it's if you know someone's playing this style it, it can it can be easier to counter it by just like raising them more frequently uh when they when they bet just because like most of those things are going to be bluffs rather than big hands uh but you know not everybody can just see the cards and how the people play huh Yeppy in chat says, Jack four offsuit is the flat tire. And I mean, I get it, but I never heard that before. I like that one. Why is it the flat tire? I think it's like when you use a jack to, I don't know, like car, oh, yeah. like to raise the tire, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 Four, four wheels on a car or something. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're going to go with until somebody clarifies it for us in chat. That's what we're going to go with. What is a jack for? But I like the four wheels oh. on a tire, Calvin. I like, but also, I like that. <laughs> that also made sense. Made sense. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like Akinia with a decision here facing this river bet. Just have kings and eights and not a great kicker to boot. So pre-move with, as we can see, the boat. But pre-move being pre-move oh, well. gets the call. <laughs> wow. Sometimes you do have to, you definitely do have to make those hero calls when you are facing such an aggressive player like Premove, but obviously, you know, didn't work out there for them. But we are going to take a quick break and we will be back with the final table of event number 42 high, the $530 buy-in five card PLO, six max PKO. We'll be right back.
All right, our second final table of the day is underway. There are seven remaining competing for the title of Scoop Champion of Five Card PLO Six Max PKO. <laughs> These are the seven players. And on the replays, unfortunately, in the PKO format, you guys are not able to see the bounties of each player, but I will make sure to keep you guys apprised as people's tournament lives are on the line and the bounty is in play. And let's welcome back our mixed game specialist of the day, Calvin Anderson, to the stream. How's it going? Ah, did you, you had a little like Good. hair break? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to do with my hair and this type of thing. I like that. No, huh? I like it. I like it. Show off my All right, Fbiana. <laughs> Fbiana missed the flush draw there. Okay, so Calvin oh, wow. five card PLO. Not a game that anybody really would be a specialist in. It's not played very often. But it kind of feels like the natural thing is more cards more possibilities, more action. You also add in the fact that, you know, this is a six max tournament and it's a progressive knockout. So I am sure that chips will be flying. Yeah, I think the specialists are typically the people that are good at like, at this point at least, are good at, uh, whoa, big action. That's a knockout. I think what the viewers don't see is that there there are bounties on, on their heads here. So um, a lot of a lot of spots you can just justify with like any cards in these situations. It's a big gamble game for sure. I'm just trying to trying to get get knockouts, get bounties. It's like a big part of the game. Yeah, but as you had mentioned, you know, when we watched the eight game final, this is again one of those scenarios where it's okay to maybe not be extremely good at five card PLO specifically, if you are good at understanding final table dynamics of understanding how the bounties factor in um, and game flow wise, those are going to be maybe even a little more important than being a five card PLO specialist. Absolutely. You know, I think uh, realizing that every single hand is pretty much equal to every single hand. <laughs> it's kind of the whole thing. And then whoever... <laughs> Whoever just goes for it and gets lucky wins. Uh, which I missed the hand where uh, Tough Dish got it in and, and, and got a big double there. And I imagine it was just one of those situations where it's just a 40-60 and he got lucky. So he's, he's, right. he's got a big advantage at this point now. Yeah, and obviously I think some viewers would recognize people like uh, Fiana, someone who also plays No Limit Hold'em, has done really well. Tough Dish, again, someone I recognize and have played against. Definitely. This this looks like it's going to be a... There's no Annie, so you, you kind of can just... I guess what I do when going into games... Uh, Oh wow! Wait, we should probably look at this hand. We got a, a yeah. It looks draw. like luck. Yes, <laughs> versus a set of deuces for luck box. Who started with the aces, but you know, post flop, you might want to play that set. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just I mean, straight draw, flush draw, every out in the book for Dane here. Yeah. But you know, like in in the shoes of open, like a wrapped and a pair and a flush draw, you still could be facing against facing like Jack, Ace King, which is very standard for people to have. So, uh, and if he got in versus that hand, he can't he can't and he, they could have a flush draw. They, he could be dominated, right? So I think just playing cautious is uh, the right move, which is exactly what he did, and. Yeah, and it's tough when you do make your flush and you're not even sure if it's the best flush because, of course, like you said, your opponent can easily have like an ace, king, a diamond type hand in this spot. 
Um, but of mm -hmm. course you have so much equity that you can't really fold either. Yeah, definitely. And I think maybe that's something good for people to remember is your hand might look really big because you have five cards to start because every flop kind of seems to give you endless possibilities, but it might be important and a cautionary tale for people to not overplay some of what could be perceived as like a huge draw in these spots. Yeah, you know, whenever you play five card PLO, you're just going to run into big hands more often than you are in four card. So we're really just playing, playing, I mean, obviously, you know, it's five card, but uh, we're just playing like a more gambly game where you're going to make them nuts a bit more. So when you're deeper uh, in spots where, you know, like if he had a wrap and a, and a flush draw on with four card, you know, re-raising getting it in would not only be standard, it would be recommended. Uh, but in that case, you know, just check calling and playing cautiously is, is is probably the best play. It's I guess it's one of the modifications that you would take in PLO versus uh, five card PLO. Yeah, so we had lost Flounder, who had about, I think, a uh, $250 bounty on their head at that point. Now the shortest stack is Effiana, who has, uh, I would say, roughly a $1,700 bounty on their head right now. So when they are all in, of course, the players will factor that bounty into their range of calling it off. Yeah, and even, you know, having a flush on a paired board in five card PLO, you don't really feel quite comfortable enough to bet that for value, just the check back that we see there from Tilt. Wow, good fold. I like the open here. Uh, wh whenever you, in a game where there's a KO, especially a game where hands run close in equity, whoever has more chips has a big advantage just because they can get your bounty and then you can't get there. So uh, I think, you know, the hands that you're going to want to play in the situations are just like, you know, if you have more chips, you can, you can play more hands. And then when you don't, you should kind of like try to be... I don't know, take a, take a more aggressive approach to try to win the hand so that you then could potentially have more chips and you can potentially get their bounty. I mean, the bounties are... They're, they're more important at this stage, too, because not only do you get the bounty, but you could potentially get, like, more of the bounty if you win the tournament because you're going to keep, you know, half of it. Half of it you get immediately, and then half of it essentially goes on your head. So, And then if you win, you know, you get the whole other half, basically. So at, at this stage, the bounties are actually worth a lot more than than they would be in early stages. So this is definitely an interesting game because you have, and on one level, it's like every hand runs so close in equity, but then on another level, you have no annies and there's not really a rush necessarily. So you can take a lot of approaches and a lot of different styles to this game. Like, you know, you can play really tight or you can play really loose and it doesn't yeah I, I mean tighter maybe it would be better but the hands run so close in equity so it's like I don't know that's what's interesting about this game uh, this is not like a fully developed strategy and, and, and I tend to like games that are that are like that more I would say what do you think yeah and I think yeah and I think that it's one of those situations where it's a little bit table dependent on the type of opponents that you have at your table, whether you maybe want to play like the tight approach or the looser approach, because obviously if everybody at the table is maybe trending towards a tighter preflop style, then you might be able to open it up quite a bit more. But if players are playing very loose and very wild, then you, because there's no antis, you might as well wait and play some of the better premium starting hands and really be able to get max value. Yeah. 
So what, what approach kind of a, would you take? Go ahead. I was just going to say, this kind is of kind of, of an interesting situation. Right, because it's like you're not really sure how wide of a button open you can go for in these situations, but if you expect the big blind to be defending at a very high frequency because, as you said, the equities run so close, you have your option of, you know, five starting cards, then maybe you don't really, you, you really have to kind of outline for yourself what your range and define that a little bit more depending on your opponent in the big blind as well. Yeah. I think, like... Being one of the two bigger stacks, you can kind of take a lot of gambles and you can take a lot of spots because it doesn't affect your stack that much and there's a lot more there's a lot more upside to just getting their bounty or just winning the pot and I think a pretty good amount of aggression is 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 totally fine because you're gonna the other players are just naturally going to play a lot more cautious. So the two bigger stacks, I think, naturally sh can and probably should be winning more of the pots in this stage. because they, And they also, they don't mind just trying to get lucky versus a short stack to get their bounty. Uh, they, sh they shouldn't, at least, you know, because uh, it's, it's, it's good. Their equities are yeah, close I mean enough, basically. Exactly. And in No Limit Hold'em, we see people sometimes go bounty crazy, trying to hunt those down and calling off with a lot wider of a range than than in other situations. So I have no doubt that in five card PLO, you can talk yourself into a lot of these loose call offs pre a lot more easier. <laughs> It looks like we got a three bet, and then he just flopped the straight nuts, so he decided to check. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and now on the end here, it looks like <laughs> a boat for TMK. Just really hoping to get some value. It's so hard, you know. You're you're the short stack, but doesn't look like Dane wanted to bite at any point. So. Yeah. So I think uh, in this game, having high cards is is a little bit more important than it than it is in PLO. So the, some of the big differences are that just you could get out wrapped a lot. Uh, so a hand like two, three, four, five, six, or something like that, uh, is just not a good hand in this game. It's really, really, really bad because, and then even, even when you're looking at a hand like, you know, top dishes hand here, it's, 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 it's good, but you know, it can, it can be dominated in, in a lot of situations. Uh, so just generic, generically, like, I mean, good starting hands are just going to be high cards and, you know, maybe double suited would be good uh so that's that's kind of like what we're looking at and... yeah certainly a hand like tmk's where they've had two flush draws by the turn with both the hearts and the clubs neither of which ends up coming in though yeah this is an interesting one i, th I think you got to go with the bluff catcher here the king the king jack yeah, Tuck Dish trying to win this pot here. <laughs> Just missing a lot of the potential straight possibilities. It's tough. It's a tough spot because, you know, it's so easy to make so many hands, so you actually can bluff a lot, you know. Good call. Yeah, probably a lot tougher of a call for TMK, too, just because they had the, the two missed flush draws. So it just makes it a little bit less likely that Tough Dish was barreling that river with one of those busted flush draws themselves. But again, good call by TMK.
yeah, it's it's tough, you know, because you have five cards and you can just have pretty much pretty much anything. So it's, yeah, it's not blinds are up to it. yeah, blinds are up to eighty thousand, a hundred and sixty thousand. It's always good to start with, you know, two big pairs. Pretty good odds you could flop a set when you have two pairs in your hand. You know what would be cool is if you could, like, if you're playing heads up or three-handed, if you could decide to, like, skip a blind level. And be like, you know, I want this to <laughs> end faster. <laughs> Let's get this going, you know. I mean, not to say they that people would, but yeah. maybe, maybe they would. Go ahead. They have that possibility, I think, in live events where if everybody else left agrees, you can skip a blind level and speed it up a little bit, but don't think that that is possible online. Mm -hmm. It could be. I'm sure they can make it make that happen. Yeah, if they, if they want if they want us to have all of the options and the freedom to decide. It doesn't seem like that hard of a, a hard of a thing. To really do. I mean, you can chop like. Yeah, like Bachi wanted here. to know. Yeah, Bachi wants to know in the chat what the hand hierarchy for this game is. It's the same as PLO or Hold'em, you know, Royal Flush. Going to be the best. Oh, well, we got a throwable there. You know, why not? Instead of going to take a walk on your break, using the restroom, grabbing a snack, why not just <laughs> to throw some of the throwables at your opponent? And you know what? If they're on a break, why not? Get your stretch on, Calvin. It looks like you, you're getting a little tired of sitting down for so long. you got to move around a little bit. So yeah, you could I mean, just lead us in a yoga session. Why don't, why don't you lead us in a, in a two-minute yoga sesh right now? Maybe everybody could take a break, do a couple downward dogs, oh. a couple of sun salutations. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't they know. They want to know if your chair that. is uncomfortable, Calvin, because I know this is not your normal setup. You're not at home. <laughs> so is the chair not to your liking? You know, I don't. This chair, I don't know. What do you think? It's. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so awful. You don't even have a cushion. My goodness. <laughs> it's like, like a, it's like a fake could... cushion. <laughs> that's not even. I mean, that chair looks so uncomfortable. Yeah, no, they're, they're, I, I'm actually, like, there's another chair in the other room that I just didn't think about getting. <laughs> I just, I don't mind. It's not that bad. It's, it's funny. Yeah, I don't think anybody blames you for standing up a little bit in that chair. Like, I've got a little, like, gaming chair, so I'm I'm good for a couple, for a couple hours. Yeah. You're so pro. <laughs> <laughs> I actually usually I know, normally... lay down whenever I... <laughs> well, normally when I play, I actually um, have a standing desk as well and a little treadmill. So that's how I like my setup when I'm playing. But when I'm doing broadcasting, it's it's a little bit harder. I guess I could stand up, but like I want to have the option of sitting down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, like so this hand it's it's good on this flop, but it's still it's still like, you know, if someone's got eight nine I don't know, you're you're <laughs> you're, you're doing like Yeah. Exactly. And so I think it's just how vulnerable your hands could be, right? Because you have two pair and a straight draw, but you could be up against a higher straight draw and now you know you're counterfeited and your opponent just happens to have trips with the ace kicker here so it's you're not really going to expect that through each street you're going to always end up with the best of it yeah that, that's that's kind of a a good point like the vulnerability of of hands is like it's going to be different when choosing like uh the type of hands you play when you play a a pot limit or no limit game you really want to have a hand that could potentially make the nuts so that you can like get a full double up or feel comfortable uh 
Yeah, um, so you can feel comfortable, right? So, um, yeah, and then and then some of the other games that you 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 know like Omaha fixed limit Omaha high low, where it's a fixed limit game or something like that you can play a bit more. Uh, you can play play a bit more looser and and even even maybe limit hold them like limit hold them versus no limit hold them. You know, you can just play looser versus uh, tighter. So in this game, like you really want to have a, a a hand that's not as vulnerable where you can potentially make the nuts. And when you have w one of those lower rack hands with a l double low flush draw, you can't really make the nuts that often because even if you start with the nuts, it's not going to be the nuts by the fifth card. You know, so. So that's why, like, this is this is a game where you actually want to have uh, quite higher hands in general. They can dominate other wraps, and you get in a lot better. Yeah, it, it's kind of like if you have a hand where it's not improving in some way on every street, and you can't end up with the nuts, it's like, how can you continue profitably on three streets? Mm -hmm. Like even there with the deuces, right? Like he he flopped deuces, but if somebody has a nine, the odds of him getting a boat are pretty high by the end. That's better. So it's kind of a, a brutal one. But you know, I mean, this 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 game does run super close in equities pre-flop. But then, like you know, if you're if you're going to be deep, it's a it's the type of game that you kind of want a pretty good hand to to, to be able to hold up against pressure. Yeah, it feels like post, you can definitely end up in really dominated situations. And you don't really want to get stuck, you know, calling a bet on every street and going after kind of the sunk cost of the chips that you've already put in the middle. Yeah, it's pretty uncomfortable, you know, to even have aces and eights here on this board for Dane. It's just, it's like, okay, Definitely. I know that it's it's very hard for you to get value from worse if you try to value bet. And, of course, that river, you just know your opponent can have so many flush draws there. Would you uh, would you call the bluff here? Oh, you're, you're beating raps, I guess, but nope, didn't do it. Yeah. I think button spot there. It's just an any two open, uh, given that you know you have a short stack. This a million chips versus four and seven. You just pe people are gonna just get the jump pretty much. Plus you get the bounty, so uh, it's just a really big advantage to have uh, a lot of chips in these spots. Yeah, Fbiana just getting shorter and shorter with that bounty on the line for a lot of the players. But it looks like in this hand, we're going to see a really big pot play out, I think, pre. It's like it's over. <laughs> yeah, set of sixes for Dane right now and gets the shove from the aces. Tilt has a bounty of just over a thousand dollars right now. So, <laughs> an ISO. Oh my goodness, this is crazy. Oh, oh sick turn. I mean, and again, that ISO you would probably never see with someone to act behind if the bounty wasn't in play. You know, certainly yeah. for Tough Dish, just uh, very aggressively attacking that bounty and risking their tournament yeah. life in turn by doing that yeah you know what i was thinking pre-flop is if i was tough dish i just i actually would have just jammed pre because you know that you know the player behind that's that's it's flatting he doesn't have like a massive hand and he's not you know if you just jam it pre and take your equity versus the bounty then you're not going to be in danger and you're squeezed in between the two if it goes call call but uh but yeah now we have an interesting dynamic here where you know the big blind you know they have they have a big bounty and everybody's gonna want to try to get it so and this is a spot where like you know if I was any player here I would try to I'd probably call this bet just to see the flop and try to get lucky to get to knock out the bounty. 
So yeah, even <laughs> small blind here is definitely a call. Yeah, so a couple players with some Broadway possibilities here. We got two pair for Dane. So we got a 2k bounty on Tough Dish's head is what it looks like. For the people who can't see. Uh, it, yeah, it's a... Uh, It'll be half of what is written there, so. Okay. All right. Well, Tough Dish tried to win the bounty and ends up getting KO'd themselves the very next hand, unfortunately. And we are down to five players. Let's see if they can go for another bet here, considering they have an overpair. They have possible straight draw with the 6-4. Doesn't go for it. <laughs> Rough river there, but, but good fold. Yeah. Really good starting hand here for TMK with the aces and the two nut flush draws. Two suited. Yeah. So Fabiana's got like a, if that's how you say it, um, $1,700 bounty. I think that's yep. the most relevant. And then luck box looks like he has a, a like a three K bounty. So those are big. Yeah. And then uh T TMK has about a twenty one hundred dollar bounty. And then the two bigger stacks are kind of small bounties actually. One K and Damien's got three K. Or yeah. So with Bobby in here, we got uh, s about seventeen fifty to to knock him out, and then it goes on your head too. So I think at any two here, pretty or any five, I guess, in the small blind is definitely definitely the right play. Yeah, we see an unsuccessful ISO here to try to go heads up against the bounty, but TMK does not want to get out of the way. It looks like a check. Oh, wow. Goes for it. This is going to go through, I think, a lot. But powerhoused. Yeah, it's just nice, again, when you have most of your opponents covered by so much that even if you did get called there by TMK post, you still end up having a 17 or 16 million chip stack. Yeah. Oh, uh, I like I like the the style that Corv is uh Till Corv is, is taking here where he's taking a pretty aggressive approach. I think that the majority of his plays are justified with the bounties and uh you can pretty much just play whatever you want. To a certain extent, when you're playing against such small, small, small stacks in relation to your to your stack, um, so yeah, I mean, I think the the two bigger stacks should be wanting to take like shots at the smaller stacks, and the smaller stacks are kind of just going to dwindle down until they 
they double up or get knocked out. But they, they kind of have to go with any hand they decide to play, they have to go with at this point. So that's that's kind of like the dynamic, I guess, we're here. We're just uh, each one is trying to outlast the other, the, the smaller stacks. And then each of the big stacks are trying to take shots at the small stacks to to grab their bounty, basically. Um, yeah, and here we go. Fiana with a really good hand to hopefully double up. Okay. Up against King Jack and is eliminated. <laughs> yeah. You know, the equities in these hands are, are significantly closer than you think. I mean, I, I don't I don't know for sure, but you could argue that, I mean, you probably, I'd probably have to plug it in, but, um, you know, the aces might have not even been a favorite preflop. It's, it's such a weird yeah, game. I, yeah, especially because they didn't really have any real straight possibilities to go with it. I think Dane's hand was very connected. Yeah, essentially post, there's going to be a lot of spots where it's just going to be like, who can flip better? Because that's how close the equities will be. And another KO there. And now there are three players left with blinds up to 100K, 200K. Yeah, what I love about this game is that uh, you don't have to be that good, really. You just kind of have to have some gamble in you. And I think the more gamble you have in you, uh, the better off you're going to do in this game, typically. So I think it's it's kind of what the people want. I feel like this is kind of the people's game, you know. It's, they just get in there, mm -hmm. uh, throw, throw some chips around, try to get lucky. If you don't, either rebuy or just, you know try again tomorrow or in the next tournament uh but you, you make a lot or you you know it's it's extremely fun you, you're gonna make a good a bit of money like pretty quick or or uh yeah you're not in general there, there's skill involved but there's a lot of luck and, and and when you when you look at uh a lot of the home games nowadays and in general more of the recreational players they're they're transitioning into games where there's a little bit less luck where the games are more balanced and I would say websites in general they don't they don't want to put a game that like you know it's any game is just not going to be that popular like you know once they pretty much solve chess it just turns into a game it's not that popular anymore so the solvable games are just they're not they're not that much fun to anyone really I mean nobody wants to play something where they they always you know lose or they or I mean obviously you want to play when you always win but no one no one will play with you. Right. I think Rex definitely prefer games where the element of luck is just enough to give them a chance to win on any given day, but not so much where they get frustrated with how lucky somebody could get against them. So it, it is that fine balance. And obviously, I was one of those players that or people that watched Queen's Gambit and I was like, oh, my God, I love chess. I want to learn. And then I realized how completely and utterly pointless it could it would be basically because everybody that has played chess for any significant amount of time is going to be infinitely better than me probably to a point that i can no longer catch up to so yeah you know with computers nowadays and 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 just fixed fixed like strategies and games they're they're just becoming a lot more solvable so i think that we're just going to avert to playing tournaments more where you have changing dynamics, where you're changing against, you're playing with new players, the blinds are going up, you're playing new games, and things are constantly changing, so you can't have, like, a computer essentially solving what you're doing. And I think that, you know, the desire to move and, you know, deviate from game to game uh, is going gonna, is gonna to be more popular in time. And people are, you know, going to try to find a different format or whatever you know uh formats to play so like you we've we've and you've seen that kind of like with hyper turbos or you know and they're making a lot of stuff up as it goes but um but but to still stay kind of in the same structure of hold them or plo yeah definitely something like spin and goes are very popular on, on so 
that element of hyper format plus, you know, shorthanded, a lot of action. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, this is this is definitely in the games that people are the, the more recreational players. But I mean, even even the pros like this game a lot. You know, it's you can make a bunch of money or really quick. So it's, it's certainly a lot of fun with the bounties. I mean, the bounties are certainly getting a lot more popular. And uh, this is, yeah, this is. I mean, I don't know. If people really thought about it, I would say that this game is is like. Maybe it was probably number two to hold them for like, you know, people, most of the people's choice. But who knows? It should be at least. <laughs> Looks like top two here for Zane and got Ace King for Tilt. Yes, even though they start with five cards, you still play two cards from your hand in this game. So that is a key point, I think, for people who haven't played much Omaha is in the beginning, they're a little thrown by having to use at least at having to use two cards from their hand. Yeah, I think it, it, naturally in this dynamic where you have a 7 mil and then 20 mil and 20 mil stack size. You're going to see a lot of caution uh, being taken with the two higher stacks just to ensure that pay jump. You know, when you're, whenever you're playing these PKO tournaments, the bump from second to third is actually really big. And then first and second nowadays, since they changed the structure relatively recently, uh, is just the same and you play for bounties. So... Um, yeah, I mean, this, this, this pay jump is pretty, pretty big, you know, it's, it's, uh, definitely not a, you, the, 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 it would be pretty bad if one of the two big stacks got into involved, involved with each other and then lost and then took third here. Um, so that they, they're going to play really cautious, I would say, uh, against each other. Um, TMK yeah. here with a boat with that eight, three. Gets the fold from the straight. TMK here with the so it, so it says it's forty three hundred. So he has half of that. It's like yeah, 20, so 2200. half would be there about yeah. Yeah, and yeah, I guess so. in that scenario, Tilt just did not think their hand was good enough to try to go for that bouncy. Mm -hmm. TMK was fairly committed with those aces. Yeah, I think he had a pair of tens, which uh, makes it a little bit tougher. When you have like all single cards, you can hit more straights and 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 uh, both. Yeah, more straights in general and hit more two pairs. So when you have a, a pair of tens, it's not going to play as well. As well. Yeah, TMK really able to chip up in these last couple of hands, just having that two and a half million chip stack and now up over nine million. Neither player betting or improving much on the river. You think he'll call a three bet this time? Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like if you face a three bet, you feel like your opponents probably have a lot of high cards, so you feel like you're live to maybe go for that bounty. But yeah, does end up making trip sevens here against the aces. 
seems hard to get away here. Yeah, it's it's one of those situations where it's a little harder in No Limit Hold'em to put your opponent on maybe having a 7x type hand when they call a 3-bet pre, but in 5-card PLO, it's definitely a little more likely that they have those 7x's. Um, but yeah, it still looks like a decent flop for aces, of course. You do have the backdoor flush draw possibility, but also the board is paired. But if you don't think that your opponent's going to raise with a full house, with, you know, fours full of sevens, then you probably feel like your backdoor outs are going to be pretty live. Yeah, big, big spot here. Tough decision for sure. Um, it, it's like, I guess the question is, is like, how often is he, is he going to like throw this, you know, extra 1.7 million, 2 million out there to try to, to try to win the, the 4.6 as a bluff and then just betting the fold? What do you think? How often do you think you'd be bluffing in this spot? Yeah, I mean, certainly they do have some type of wraps with back backdoor flush draws as their semi bluffs, but but that was a very disciplined fold, I would say, from TMK. I, I think it is pretty opponent dependent how often your opponent has is more bluff heavy on that type of board, but it does seem somewhat dry. Yeah, that was a really good fold. You know, I don't, I don't know too many people that would necessarily make that, but he gave himself a little room there uh, by just spending a th less than a third of a pot. And yeah, it was a, it was a, one of those game time read decisions, and uh, definitely really good. For those in chat asking, they're a little confused at what game this is. It is five card pot limit Omaha, so. Versus regular Pot Limit Omaha, where you only start with four cards. These players are going to get dealt five to start. And then it plays just like Pot Limit Omaha post. But there's also the element of the progressive knockout as well, where there are going to be bounties on these players' heads, where unfortunately on the replayer, you guys aren't able to see the bounties that they will be playing for. But when people's stacks are on the line, we'll make sure you guys know just how much that bounty is worth. Not flush here for Dane, and it looks like tilt just with queens and nines. So he's got the two blocker, the jack blocker, and he's turning it into a bluff. Yeah, it's nice when you're blocking the boats, and also you can rep the full house as well. <laughs> wow, oh. gets it done. Two barrels on the bluff, repping a boat. <laughs> yeah, it's something you can definitely do in this game. And another reason why I do like it is because, you know, you can bluff you can bluff a lot of hands with a lot of blockers. And it's much more believable than, than a game like regular four-card PLO because in five-card, you know, people just, they just have the hand more often and people are willing to make bigger folds. So it's, I, I'd like to think that I'm better at, I mean, I, I definitely am better at five card than four card. And, and four card, you know, I'm getting a bit too, too loose and people are calling me down. And since my game, you know, it kind of is more bluff dependent. It's Yeah, <laughs> yeah it would seem that in five card PLO, I think it does favor somebody who might be a little bit more bluff heavy because people will find more folds than they would in four card. <laughs> and we see Dane try to try to rep the hand that TMK had in that spot straight. Yeah. But I like Doesn't to see it. Like I like to see right, and I like to see them try to mix it up and try to win pots that don't belong to them. For sure. Set of aces up against ace jack here. Oh. 
And this is a situation where maybe players might be tempted to slow play, but if you think your opponent has a lot of king x's here, then you might as well bet and not lose value from trips in that spot, even though you do have a boat. Yeah, in general, I think slow playing in this game is going to be, I don't think it's going to be as good of a strategy because someone can just have so many different hands, right? So you, you really want to get value and charge people for draws a lot more than you would in other games. Yeah, it's, it's not that hard for people to find a reason to call when they have five cards to work with. Definitely. I think in No Limit Hold'em, that may have been, you know, a decent spot to check back. But again, your opponents will have a lot of King X's in that spot as well, where you want to get value from trips. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it looks like the stack dynamics has changed a bit, where we have a player with a little over half the chips, and then two other, you know, we have... 27 versus 11 and 13 so shorter stacks are going to want to be a little bit more cautious get this pay jump and then the bigger stack is going to play aggressive and i think you know each one of these players given that they had more chips they would all do the same thing pretty much but uh it just happens to be that tilt has them Lines are going up to 125k, 250k, and most of the players are really just trying to maintain their stack size at this point, not get into too many big unnecessary confrontations, and I'm sure as Tilt, you'll be able to take advantage of that. Definitely. What I, what I think I would do if I was Tilt in this situation is I would try to make pots a little bit bigger pre-flop because he's going to win a lot more of the pots post-flop uh, just by blind aggression in general. And I would take a bit more stabs uh, as a bigger stack just because uh, you're just going to win and, and you want you actually want to make the pots bigger to make the other opponents more uncomfortable and because you're just going to win post-flop more often where... If I was the two smaller stacks, then I would want to play uh, more of a limp game and more of a, you know, caution, cautious game just to try to outlast the other player. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's one thing that you were saying about adjusting to these type of always changing tournament dynamics is one at one point, you could be the big stack against two really short stacks, or you're, you're the big stack up against a medium stack and a short stack, or in this situation where the two stacks aren't very short, but they're pretty equal, uh, definitely a different plan of attack as the chip leader, depending on all of these configurations. Yeah, so the game doesn't necessarily matter. And I think a big reason why, you know, I have so much success in, in some of these uh, scoops is just because the, I understand these concepts reasonably well and I kind of like, you know, do them a little bit better than the average person. So uh, when I actually do make the final table, I have a, I really give myself a pretty good chance to win where I, I, I oftentimes lose and don't, you know, don't do well. But uh, when I, when I, Yes, yeah, so, uh, but I but I win more often than I than I think I. Yeah, I, I definitely have a lot more wins than I do seconds and thirds and fourths, and then I probably have too many ninths. <laughs> do you feel like you, these days, are enjoying playing a little bit less than before, maybe, or you know, you're probably not playing as much as you used to, because I know that before you would be grinding these entire series, you know, all the W coops, all the scoops. Yeah, no, this is this is uh, one of the first scoops uh, that I've just straight up missed. I think it is the first scoop that I missed since I started, and uh, it's I've just been involved in like cryptocurrencies and doing doing a lot of other things, and it doesn't it doesn't make as much sense for me. I love the game, you know, but uh, so this is a really exciting way for me to get involved still. Uh, whenever you know you ask me to come on, I'm like, oh, you know, this would be. This would be a lot of fun, so I get a little taste. But uh, it, you know, I, it just doesn't make, I guess, sense. 
profitability wise, I guess, you know, like um, it, you can just make a, a trade or, you know, buy or sell <laughs> with leverage, like, you know, Bitcoin or something like that. Then it's, it's, it's just, it's just a lot, I guess, higher stakes uh, than, than what it is nowadays. Does watching projects. these replays make you miss it though? Like, are you like, oh, I, I kind of want to get in there. I'm tempted. I see how I could be playing some of these spots better than some of these other players. Uh, I mean, yeah, you know, the mixed games, I feel like I'm, I'm still a very top tier mixed game player. My, my, I, I don't know if for me, my like studying Hold'em as much as I probably should to get better is, is worth it at this stage where I'd rather just rely on my natural ability and then not, not do as much work. And it's, it's something that I just don't care about, you know, crunching numbers and looking at the solvers and stuff. It's, it's very boring to me. I, I like to play people dynamics and, and then, you know, I'll go play live and, and I'll be able to do well. I'll probably be around for the world series. And um, it's, it, you know, the whole COVID, it just kind of got a lot of people burnt out, I think, too, because every every single website ran a series and, you know, everybody, it's just like play, 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 play. And then, you know, I, I you know, to me, Scoop was, was, has always been my favorite um, series. I love the, the way that everything's, everything is. It's just you get a little bit burnt whenever every series is just like big tournaments, big guarantees and. More games are offering. More sites are offering mix, but Stars does offer the most mixed games, and I definitely, like most people, prefer to play on Poker Stars for sure. But uh, yeah, it's just it's just a combination of a lot of things, you know. The games the games are changing, and but yeah, what about you? You're not. I don't see you on the felt, them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I'm kind of with you. You know, I feel like I you know, studying hardcore all of the time just is not how I want to spend the majority of my time. But of course, you know that you have to study a fair amount to keep up with where the game is now and where it's headed. But yeah, there's there's a part of me that I feel like sad that I miss out on these great series like Scoop. But it is nice to get to commentate on it and be on this other side because like you said, I still get a little taste of it. I still get to watch and see how players are playing nowadays and feel like in that way I'm keeping up with the trends and the evolution of the game. Um, but yeah, it's it just depends on the day for me. You know, sometimes I'm really in the mood to grind and sometimes I'm not. And I think one thing I've learned being in poker for over 15 years is to not force myself to play when I'm not in the mood because forcing myself to play before resulted in me playing poorly and I would rather just not show up if if I don't think I'm going to be able to play my best that day. Yeah. No player has the flush here, which is pretty surprising in a three-way pot when each player has five cards, but that's going to happen sometimes. <laughs> yeah, Raksha, I was like, yeah, maybe that's not, that, that didn't, that was not very likely that none of the players had a spade, but it happens. We're like, check the deck. Let's make sure that there is indeed 13 spades in there. <laughs> Jacks and nines are going to take down that pot. How many players are left? There are three players. This is the final table replay of the $530 buy-in five card PLO, six max, progressive knockout. And these are the only three players that remain. So 
tilt betting the jacks here. Betting pot here, just protecting against all of those flush and straight possibilities. Cautious fold. Uncle wants to know who do we think is going to win? I don't know, Calvin. Who do you think is going to win? I mean, what's your experience with these players? Do you recognize them at all? Do you like how they've been playing this final table so far? Um, yeah, it's it's hard to know. Uh, yeah, it's it's really difficult to know. I mean, naturally, you would just think one of the bigger stacks. Obviously, that's a it's an easy guess, but um. Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I think Tilt, you know, does have the chip lead, but I would go, I would probably lean towards Tilt taking this one down just because I feel like we haven't really seen them get too out of line, but also they are pacing well with the chip lead and being aggressive in the right spots, but not necessarily being reckless. Mm-hmm. I feel like a lot of caution is going to happen, and then it's just going to be a really big pot. Yeah. It's like uneventful yeah, and, this and then very eventful. Yeah, in this situation, you definitely want to, you know, wait for those type of situations where you have a lot of equity and it's a potential cooler because a lot of the times you're not necessarily going to have a nutted type hand and we've seen people not willing to go for thin value obviously because it's always a possibility that your opponent can just have you notched some people asking about the bounties so we'll give you guys a little refresher TMK on the bottom of your screen there has a bounty of about $2,200, and then we have Dane to the left of that player having close to 4000 on their head, and then Tilt as the chip leader, about $2,500, but having everybody covered, your bounty is probably not going to be on the line for a while. You know, given the bounties, I think Dane has the best chance of winning. Since he has the biggest bounty, I assume he's a bit more aggressive and willing to go for it. So uh, I would say that, you know, if I was to guess who was going to win, I would say it's him. Yeah, TMK really doing a good job of just hanging in there and trying to stay level with Dane. Yeah, he's cautious JB on for sure. And... Yeah. JB on YouTube wrote, Maria, do you read the chat? I do. <laughs> there is your proof that I do. <laughs> TMK with the flush and going to check it back, just not a really good board necessarily where you're going to get value from worse. So yeah, the way that the majority of the players are playing right now, it seems like we're going to we're going to have to see a cooler. People are playing pretty cautious, you know. Taking third is 
it's a good result, you know, out of so many people. But once you're at at three, you know, you really want to try to get at least second and play for the win. And uh, and the thing is, is you're just ho you're kind of hoping as the third player that the other two people just get involved and get it in, regardless of who they are, so that you have like um, a bit of a, a free roll to you know maybe win this thing and. The bounties don't even necessarily matter because the pay jumps like you know you're looking at 7k which is kind of like that's what fourth basically got so it's uh this is quite a big jump it's uh yeah definitely all the players are attempting to get get there yeah set of kings here for tilt but dane with a lot of outs got the nut flush draw got a straight draw possibility But again, tough when you're facing these pot size bets with one card to come and you're on a draw. Oh yeah, Calvin, you'll you'll probably do much better that way. Standing up, tilt the camera up, this is gonna be good for you. <laughs> Ride it out. I got that I got that photo angle, you know, all the girls like you when you <laughs> take the photo from the bottom. <laughs> Tens and sevens here, gonna make the call. Wow, again, another hand where three ways and nobody has a club in their hand. Earlier we saw three ways, nobody had a spade. I mean, Check the deck. Where are all the clubs at? Wow. And tough to go for any value in multi-way situations, you know, when you don't have a nutted hand. I take it this is the longest you've had to wear a headset for a Calvin. You're like, ah, <laughs> I need yeah, my head arrest. I, I know, yeah, I don't ever even hardly wore a headset. They they bought this. They basically bought this and sent it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, my ears well, are a little bit hot, but enjoy enjoy your new headset. <laughs> <laughs> A stab that will not work. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Up against trip fours with the ace kicker. Just gonna go for the raise right away and shut it down. Yeah, it seems like it's a hard situation to know exactly what type of hands you should be calling from the small blind against button opens, you know, because it's easy to feel like you can call a bit wider, obviously, because you have five cards to start, but you don't want to get in the habit of necessarily calling too wide from the small blind three ways. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh people are definitely playing like we're very cautious right now and they're definitely not uh, uh yeah, this is this is maybe some fireworks right here. 
So I think it's I think the way these things go a lot of the times is they they're not really that exciting until they are, and then this is this is one of those spots where it's like they are essentially. Yeah, especially so, yeah, against yeah against that flat from the small blind aces really wants to put max pressure and probably pretty happy, you know, even to just get folds here. Yes, they're double suited, but. It, it still is a pretty significant pickup to get 1.8 million in chips dead without seeing a run out in five card PLO. Yeah, this is this is a hundred percent call here. Let's uh, see see a flop. Yeah, that that hand is so coordinated, and you have a chance to win the bounty post maybe. So yeah. A little surprising, I think, to see the fold. Yeah, it's it's tough, you know, and and, and it kind of shows by him from Tilt's bounties that he has to this point is uh, he only has two K, which, which at this stage in the tournament most players have more. So he's he's playing cautious, you know. He he, he believes his skill set and his understanding of the game is much better post flop, and he doesn't want to get in too many super inflated pots. Uh, it's, it seems to be his strategy, and you know, I'm not saying that. He's like a bad player by any means. He, he, you know, it's just everybody kind of sticks with their their own skill set and their own understanding of the game, and they they under, they take risks that they feel comfortable taking. And um, you know, maybe in this hand right here is one that he would much rather, you know, take a risk with. And you know, he's he's probably he may know equities better than I do. And um, so yeah, I mean, he clearly he clearly is choosing doing something right get this far yeah setting things here. here yeah attractive sizing bet you get a float <laughs> yeah and definitely turning a lot of possibilities here for the straight yeah, I like a check here from tilt if he if he has it in him and it's a pot size bet so uh it's good. It's a good spot to just check in, calling all in, and uh, really, really interesting spot for Damon here. What would you do? Oh, here we go. Yeah, I guess they do want to go for it here, and really well played by Tilt. Let's see if they could hold on the river. And now we are heads up, guys. Yeah, all right, was... Soren in the chat. That was, yeah, that was really, <laughs> that was one of those hands where it's like, if Tilt had bet, then they would have gotten a fold from Dane, but because they checked, they got Dane to semi-bluff. Soren in the chat asks, why is the payout for first and second identical? Well, if you've watched other final tables where the format is a progressive knockout, then you would know that a lot of these payouts are basically the way it is because with the bounties included that's really where the separation between the first place payout and second place payout will come in so a quick update on the bounties right now for example tmk has about a twenty two hundred dollar bounty on their head and tilt has about a forty five hundred dollar bounty on their head so when you end up knocking out the other player heads up you will win their bounty but you also get to keep your own bounty so that represents quite a big difference in the payout between first and second place at that point in time. Yeah, definitely very well played last hand, I'd say, uh, from his sizing, inducing the float, and then, you know, checking the turn to get him to bluff is uh, very, very, very skillful uh, in the way that he played that hand. And it kind of like... It kind of goes to what I was saying earlier, where you know he doesn't want to take these really big risk pre-flop without pretty good hands, because you know he's 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 got a really good post-flop game, and he knows he knows what to do and how to play post-flop, and it shows right there. So you know his his strategy is has got him to this point, and you know that's what's kind of funny about opinions of of games is like you don't really know because some people are good at certain things and. Some are good than others, and a lot of people like to have their, like, 
image of like what a good player is or what a bad player is and it's it's not really that easy because uh there's so many different styles that that kind of win and and you you gotta have to be aware i think awareness and adaptability is is more so the key yeah and some people wondering what dane's bounty was at the time that they got knocked out and at that point in time tilt won close to four thousand dollars for knocking dane out in that hand So when we had the dynamic of three-handed and you had a lot of uh, caution being taken to try to get to the next spot, I think that, you know, the majority of that caution is just, or it's, it's, it's over now. Like the whole goal at this point is just, you know, obviously stack the other player without, without caution. So, you're, you, you know, you should typically see a lot more fearlessness, uh, whether you're, even if uh, a player is outskilled, I think whenever they start, whenever they get heads up, they play a lot better because, you know, this is, it's, you know, there's nothing else, there's nothing like left to lose in a sense. So, um, so yeah, this is, this should be a good heads up match. Yeah, I think we'll definitely see both players, but more so maybe TMK opening up their ranges just because it is heads up, you pretty much have nowhere to hide. You're going to have to get involved in every pot, whether you like it or not. You have to stand your ground a bit, not get run over in the heads up situation. Yeah. So, um, you know, Tilt, Tilt, Tilt is, uh, he seems to be the more experienced player. And I'm not positive about that, but you know, him limping the button is definitely a sign of wanting to pot control, wanting to be in the pot in position, and wanting to, like, yeah, t take a low-variance approach. And that's that's definitely a good... It's This is definitely a sign of a player that's you know, thinks that they're better than the other player, and, you know, a lot of the times they are, or at least more experienced, you know, uh, in this setting, which he, he, he's definitely... Should shown that in my, in my opinion yes this stream is live we're currently commentating live right now but it is over a replay of a final table so this final table has already concluded and we are watching it back now but the commentary is live I like we could do Simon I says actually, right now with the people in chat <laughs> what are you saying Calvin Oh, I didn't even know that to be honest. I'm I'm out the game a little <laughs> bit, so uh, so this is totally like organic. My thoughts on everything. I wasn't who I wasn't sure who made the final table. I didn't prepare in any way, so it, it's kind of better that way. So I'm not like being being biased. It is. To, like my for yeah. sure. I mean, if you if you watched it already, it's a little bit easier to kind of later on say, okay, well, this was a good play because you know that it worked. Definitely. It's like we got a break here. Yeah. Calvin, are you just going to stay standing? I feel like you could do it. I think we got like maybe, you know, we're heads up. We've probably got like 30 or 40 minutes left on this final. You know, you feel a little more comfortable standing up. We're going to just ride it out. It, it makes me want to stand up, but there's going to be too much adjusting going on if I do it. So. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> on a little left off. But yeah, no, I enjoy standing. I'm not... I'm not used to sitting, you know, when I play poker, I don't, I don't, I sit for maybe an hour and then I lay down or I stand up. Basically, I'm just sitting. It's just like, you're kind of like, I don't know. I, just, I, I was sitting for quite a while, but then after a while it gets, gets to be a lot. Yeah. So just to recap today, we started out showing the high buy-in of eight game and that definitely went really fast in terms of the pace of play and then we moved into this high buy-in of $530 for the five card PLO and I would say that there were some moments of intense action followed by some lulls but now that we are down to heads up I think that you might not see a lot of big pots but certainly I think we're going to go post flop quite a bit um, we're going to go multiple streets post
definitely a big turn here. Tilt, tilt's a tilt's definitely a good player. The check back here is uh, pretty solid. It's pot control cautious, and he's probably just gonna turn this this what was basically the nuts in the flop. He's just turning it into a bluff catcher. Whoa, and he folds it. Whoa. Wow! Big strong fold. <laughs> I, I mean, I would I would say that that's maybe even bad, but you know, I mean, he's here, so you know, this guy knows <laughs> something. Yeah, considering that the turn was check back, you know, you would assume that they're just gonna be obligated to call on the river in that spot, but didn't even take that much time to think about it either. We're just very <laughs> know, convinced I... that TMK did not have any bluffs there. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm I would say that PLO is my worst game, but uh I've certainly played a lot of it and you know, I I think I'm better at five card PLO, but I'm also going to err on the side of calling bluffs uh but I think that you know, maybe it's just my style and in general whenever you know, whenever you when you when you look at people's styles, somebody that bluffs a lot, they also call bluffs a lot. And then somebody that doesn't bluff a lot, they don't they don't call bluffs as much either and the reason for that is because most people kind of just think that the way that they think is the way that everyone else thinks so they're kind of just their style is based on you know what they think everyone else thinks kind of and this goes in a lot of other areas of life which is a big reason why i've been in poker so long and i've enjoyed it so much is that you can relate so many things to so many other things in areas of poker yeah i mean essentially if you know, if you feel like your players, your opponents are capable of bluffing, and you might think that because you know you're capable of bluffing in certain spots, then you're like, okay, well, I feel like I have to call. Yeah, and I think that's kind of like the stages of, of being a good, not only a good poker player, but it's just like kind of understanding people a little bit better. Is like if you just, if you only play poker thinking that everybody plays the same way that you do, you're not gonna, you're not gonna really have that much success. And then, you know, right. getting into the minds of other people and uh, asking questions and understanding other people and uh, really just opening up, opening up the, open up your mind to all that is uh, definitely going to be um, how you become not only a s smarter human or whatever in a lot of other areas, but definitely a better poker player. Yeah, I mean, this is a fairly deep stacked heads up match right now you see the big blinds 300k so effective stack size is pretty big and again pot limit versus no limit you're not really going to see stacks at this depth be able to get it in pre of course so TMK electing to raise with this type of hand. Suited, connected, but gonna get the three bet with aces from tilt here. Yeah, even though you so flopped two pair <laughs> here, it's not a, yeah. it's not really looking that pretty. Yeah, I mean, Tilt has so much board coverage here with the set, with the flush draw. He flops such a big hand, he doesn't even know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> He's in the time bank. I know. Last time it worked out well to check it, but <laughs> mm -hmm. this time... Making it look easy to hit mm -hmm. sets. Wow. Cautious fold there with the opening a straight draw on top pair. But, uh, you know, you, you just can't really improve your hand that much. And you, you could just be dominated or beat. So that, And that's one of the negatives of playing one of those low low hands. Given he did just check back on the, in the big blind, he was forced in. Um, 
it's just can't really hold up against pressure in a lot of situations. So if you have somebody that's gonna double barrel, triple barrel, it's you're in yeah, you're in a spot where you can't really do much. Yeah, I think once you've kind of built up your image to where your tilt and players know that they can expect you to fire multiple streets, then it might make them a little bit more hesitant about calling flop bets because they know that they're going to be faced with another bet on the turn. So it's actually good for tilt to maybe establish that because players are kind of afraid to continue with marginal hands against you because they know that you're going to keep applying aggression on later streets. Yeah, definitely. That's that gives you a few free, free pots if you're uh, if you're known as more of an aggressive player, you're willing to willing to throw out multiple barrows. People a lot of times give up, give up early. Yeah, that's why I folded the jacks to you on the turn because I'm like, I know if I call, I'm gonna he's gonna shove. <laughs> it's just the right stack to pot ratio where he's setting it up for a shove. So why? If I don't really know where I'm at right now, I don't want to continue. So just have it. <laughs> sounds like sounds like that hand haunts you pretty a lot. <laughs> right? I'm, you're like, wow, Maria, you remember the SPR and everything that was like 12 years ago? Get over it. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> it's funny. Wow, nice little bluff here from TMK that no, gets through. Oh, it's I'm sorry, value, what did, what did yeah, TMK it's have? Oh, it's, there are that. so many cards on the boards. It's I, was <laughs> like, I was like, he has a straight draw? No, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tough to be able to see so many. Like you got to look at 10 cards and coordinate them and then compare them to the other 10, 5 cards. It's not easy. So we got a double blockers on both ends, of both players, for to the nuts, and then you actually have the straight. So like, this is a spot where like you know, I could see I could see tilt uh, making a move there with the tens, uh, just to like have the double blockers to the nuts there. But he'll pass. He's he's too good. Real small sizing here from Tilt, just trying to get a little bit of value with aces and jacks here. TMK fast playing that boat with the ace and the four. Wow, tough to start with trips and still manage for the case ace to come. That's crazy. <laughs> I remember the first time I played like Omaha, Omaha 8 or better, any form of Omaha. And I obviously I feel like your inclination should be like, okay, well, it makes sense that trips are bad. But if you play No Limit Hold'em, then you're like, oh, I started with three of a kind. This, this has to be good, right? But no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes when I'm, when I'm pretty bored, playing one table live <laughs> i uh try to make side bets with people just to say you know if when you're playing something like omaha if you get trips then you owe me you know if either one of us get trips at any point in the hand you get like a thousand bucks or something right or four of a kind that's a lot of trust i feel like that's a lot of trust yeah. because they have to just you have to believe that they were out trips because you're probably not going to see it go to showdown <laughs> True. Yeah. No. I mean, you, you kind of take a picture or something like that if you don't. If it's, I mean, I'm not doing this with uh, 
I don't want to say anybody. <laughs> Which is to anybody, but... right? You're not going to yeah. do this with a stranger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's it's something to pass the time for sure, and give you feel like you actually won something when you got the trips, even though it's definitely a, a negative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but a uh, thousand dollar per, per like hand on a prop, Calvin. Jeez. Hey, yo. <laughs> <laughs> they don't happen often, so. <laughs> Check yeah, I mean this game. Yeah. Yeah, it's playing playing real cautious, and you know, like I think the the best player, the most the most cautious, and and uh, yeah, you, there's no annies, there's no rush really, right? So just play your game. Yeah, if you definitely have the patience, then you know, picking up a lot of smaller pots not necessarily getting involved in really high variance spots and just trying to chip away until you really get that one big cooler type scenario is probably a decent strategy to employ. I mean, again, these stacks are still relatively deep. Yeah, this was a situation where, you know, if I was playing this game, I would maybe just like want to move the blinds up a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> you know... Who, who who knows it's you could do it live but online it would just be a cool option just because i mean sometimes you know when you play when you play some some tournament that lasted like quite a while it's the end of the night and it's it's you're not playing for that much money and uh you know sometimes it, people will just agree to if you have like 200 300 blinds you know it's you'd rather just move the blinds up and just get it moving because you still want to play it out but you, yeah, this is big flop here, huh? Three bet pre call. Yeah, lots of possibilities here for TMK. Tilt has two pair with a flush draw. Not a very good flush draw, but true. Does have back. Yeah, I mean I... as well. Yeah, I assume he'll check back just to be a little cautious because that's how he's been playing. But uh, if he does bet... Uh, wow, goes for pot. Some... Yeah, I, I, don't see, I don't see this not being all in moment here. You know. What do you think? Wow. Yeah, well, TMK does call, but still a really big turn card there. I mean, TMK has the straight, but tilt has two flush draws with two pair Jackson fives at the moment. <sighs> He's got, I mean, with the double flush draw, the two pair, you got to call off here for sure. Yeah. There it is. There it goes. The pendulum just swings TMK's way with a full double up there. Yeah, just so much equity for tilt that didn't come in. Also, again, the bounty was in play. Yep. Yeah, that was big. That was a big hand. Uh, and that's kind of how these things are going to go a lot of the times. Just small pots, then all ends. It's funny. This is this is, this was uh, the underdog. I feel like three, three, three handed. Yeah. I mean, TMK was not TMK. either of our pick to win. Tilt now playing about 40 bigs effective, which is still pretty deep in pot limit Omaha for sure. And again, like you said, with the style that I feel like both of these players have been playing, I think 40 bigs is more than enough to mount to come back at this point. So at this point, uh, it looks like there's 19... Uh... 19k to the uh, to first and second, but the bounties that are remaining are about 9k and like 4300. So in this case, 
whoever wins is just gonna win an extra 9k plus 4300 correct they'll win half of their opponents half of that number that you're seeing um in in our sky yeah but since it's plus since it's their... the end then it's right, all, yes right? that's right and right and their own bounty as well so they just keep yeah so basically like what so like what's being played for right now like 13,000 basically 14,000 yeah let me check the numbers yeah I would say about that nice yeah, about 13,400 is what we are playing for heads up here. Pretty big. But, it, you know, it's... It's, it's kind of hard to calculate with uh, how much they've already won. Because it looks like Tilt has won a little bit more bounties already. Um, yeah. Quick check over the till on the flop with the flush draw from TMK, but gonna bet this turn now. I mean, probably pretty nice to have the king in your hand. It's gonna be a key card. Now turning a straight draw to go with their flush draw. Not going to bet it though. Makes the straight at the end and wins the pot. But again, on a paired board, when you have a straight, you still might not feel that comfortable betting it for value really in essence, bluff catching at that point with the straight. And this is the part that might get confusing for, you know, first time Omaha players is TMK does not have a boat. Can't, TMK actually is well, playing trip queens. He, he does well, now, now on the river, the river has a boat. Turn. Yes, but not on the turn. Exactly. Because again, you have yeah, to play two it's... cards from your hand. So. Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah. But of course, trips are going to be the, really good there a lot of the time. So you're not you're not that worried, but. I think players have mistakenly, you know, bet hands in situations where they think they might have had a boat when they just had trips at that point. Wow, just a fold with two pair from Tilt against the higher two pair. TMK actually did have King Jack for Kings and Jacks and Tilt folding King Six for Kings and Sixes. Super cautious plays, plays going on here, you know. These yeah, guys I think Tilt me. just, oh. <laughs> you're like, I'd at least call one shoot. I would call one too, Calvin. I feel like Tilt just maybe felt like there's just a lot of bad turn cards, you know, obviously flush and straight possibilities, and maybe just feeling like their edge against TMK is to be found in, in uncontested pots where TMK is not leading the betting. Oh, well. It's a big turn there. Yeah, boat against trips. Both players also have flush draws as well. Oh, wow. Now improving to jacks full of fours up against aces full of jacks. 
Whoa. This is this is sick, tricky, man. <laughs> it is definitely play that very very tricky and really trying to go big here for value. Really lucky yeah. that TMK has even a boat here, but could TMK find the fold? Uh oh. Just too strong, right? It just looks so strong when you're just checking all the way and then find a check raise on a paired board. Like, it's you got to have a big bow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, people <laughs> don't really play the hand the way he played it. That was... He checked back aces, is what it seems, and then doesn't bet it and then check raises the river, basically. I mean, that was just, you know, you can't really. That's... He's not going to get paid there a lot. I mean, he's not going to attract a bet to be able to check raise, but um, yeah, he's, he got lucky to run into the right hand. Wow. Big turn card here, boat versus straight. I mean, there is a flush draw on a pretty obvious boat, so I don't think that, uh, you know, they're going to get too much money, but... Uh, you, you could get you could get one here a lot. I think you know, given especially that you have the double blockers. Um, but nah, these, these tilt guys just are, really good, folding. Good. Yeah, I mean tilt just you know folding in several situations where yeah, I think that it would be, you know, you can't blame a player to take one off in that spot and then decide on the river and see if their opponent shuts down. But tilt really not even risking any chips in these situations and just losing the minimum really yeah definitely uh it's he's he's a good player you know he's not trying to get involved in in too unprofitable too many unprofitable spots just just being more selective and you know that's his style and he, he he's he's here heads up so probably should stick with it Yeah, and I just get the sense that Tilt feels like TMK is playing pretty honest and that a lot of times when they do show aggression, it's much more likely to be made hands and value than semi-bluffs. And so far they've been right because, you know, TMK hasn't really been taking a lot of lines that are more bluff heavy or semi-bluff heavy. I mean, with the way that these players are playing, I definitely think it's going to take one or two big coolers for it to end because there's not going to be any real out-of-line bets and big pots being played without hands. Yeah, I mean, you got a lot of... There's no annies and the blinds aren't, like, crazy big, so, like, you know, you get time to play your game. And this it's their tournament you know this is this is a big moment for, for both players with a lot of uh, a lot of money on the line so they're they're gonna they're gonna try definitely they're both definitely both trying their best and that's yeah that's a yeah it's fun to be in situations where you are betting and you're both trying your best so you can really see that that skill set both people, players are taking it really serious and I think uh, it doesn't really matter the level that you're playing uh, what I really liked about playing online is that you know, as long as you are playing for some amount of money, I think that most people are trying their best, and and I like and I like that dynamic. So even if you are playing really low stakes or high stakes, you know, m most of the time, a good a good 90, 95, 99 percent of the time or so, uh, people are people are really 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 trying to do well, which gives you that experience to play. So as you know, a recreational or like new players, I think taking the leap from going from play money. To, uh, just playing for for a few pennies or dollars or whatever I think it's it's such a it's such a different feel you know it's it's much more it's much much more important I would say just to play for a small amount of money in comparison to no money where people where people care yeah and I definitely feel like in this situation you're really gonna get your money's worth because as either of these players you're not gonna have that many ex many 
times where you get to experience playing heads up in five card PLO um, at this stack depth. And it's just a really good way to gain experience in this game because you won't find many of these opportunities and you could essentially play more hands at this final table than most players will have played all year in this specific game and specific format. Definitely. Might have, might have some action here. We got a double suited hand defending, but no dice on the flop. Yeah, wrong suit for both players, but Tim K probably happy that uh doesn't know it yet, but happy that it's not hearts because they were dominated in hearts. Mm -hmm. Turns it straight here with the uh... yeah. Loading up. Oh wow, the tricky check. I don't think he's gonna get a bet. <laughs> yeah, so far the the tricky checks and slow plays are not working out quite as well for TMK as it is for for Tilt. True, true. It's it's difficult, mm -hmm. like we were saying earlier. You know, it's difficult to make those slow plays and make those checks and stuff. It's just not a. You're not going to run into hands, especially whenever you have blockers to the hands that you know that they kind of need in order to be able to beat them. So when when you know Tilt did do that with the aces, he he wasn't blocking uh, the lower boats and jacks. So it it makes it a little bit better, but still. It's still, uh, you're better off in a game like PLO, or if you got it, you should bet it, I think. Big action here, I think. Got two pair uh, from TMK and a uh, full wrap for uh, Tilt, so. Um, I could see, I could see a lot of stuff happening here. Uh, this is definitely a good opportunity to bluff and, you know. TMK could definitely jam it in here. Uh, I, I think that's probably what's going to happen. Do you think he's going to just going to go for it here? Yeah, I mean, Tilt has about seven and a half million back, so yeah, I think that looks like a good play. Just and boats up, and it looks like that is going to be it. Unfortunately for Tilt, played a really solid game all the way up until you know just a couple of cooler spots, as we saw. So, really, really fun final, two finals today. Thank you, Calvin, for joining us, us of course, and for all of you guys out there. There is going to be more live action tomorrow with the conclusion of the 10K. PKO high roller, so more bounties to come. And for now, from Calvin Anderson and myself, Maria Ho, it's good night.